27. The shot takes out a chunk of my arm and spins me all the way around until I'm facing the strike team. They're wearing plain clothes, but they're packing 1911s. That 45 would have stopped me cold if it had been hollow point and a little to the left. How did the idiot shooter miss my body? Or even better, my head? They're wearing masks and gloves, and they're dressed in black gear, but that can't disguise their frames. There are four of them, and I flog my fuzzy brain to process the data in front of my eyes. The first is tall, even for an Evian. He's got to be close to seven feet. A small blonde curl pokes out from under his black mask. The second is tall, but not as tall, and he's broad. I can't see any hair, but the bump in the back of his masked head tells me his hair is long, probably pulled back in a ponytail. The third is a woman whose footwear I recognize. Valentino rock stud boots, customized for her. I already know the soles of the boots are crossed with spider webs. Her real name is Rivera, but she goes by Recluse. Rivera hasn't trusted anyone since her brother died in the field. Her anger needed an outlet, and she naturally gravitated toward the angriest person I know, my twin. I don't recognize the fourth man, but if Rivera's leading the team, Judica sent them. The tall one is Dietrich, the broad man is Lorne, and the fourth could be any of her other guards. Somehow, Judica found out I'm naming Edom as consort. The odds may have shifted in my favor finally, but only if I survive this assassination attempt. By the time I shove Noah to the ground, I've already healed from the ill-aimed shot. Stay down, I say. Wait, did someone shoot you? Noah tries to stand, but I kick his legs out from under him, slamming him face down onto the pavement. A broken nose is better than a hole in the head. They fire three more shots, one slamming into my left leg one whizzing past my head, and one lodging in my left clavicle. Noah, stay down! I dig the fingers of my right hand into the hole in my shoulder and yank on it until I dislodge the bullet. When I toss it into the river, I glance at Noah, who promptly rubs his eyes. I shouldn't have yanked the bullet out like that, but it might have been an exploding round. Besides, I can't heal with a bullet lodged in my bone. Did we stumble into some kind of gang fight? Noah tries to stand again. I shove him down again. Noah, stay down and close your eyes. Trust me. Maybe we can take care of this fast and he'll think he hallucinated it. I look back at my four shooters, clustered together against a building for cover. Hiding together is their biggest mistake. They should be coming at me from several different locations. When I glance back, I realize why they're huddling. Donovan and Rennie have taken out two other assailants on the north side. But Rennie is down, too. A glance to the south shows Matthias and Simeon with a man face down on the pavement. But Simeon's limping. It's good my guards are doing their job, but there's no one to take out these four. I crouch down next to Noah, who is finally listening to me and staying near the ground. Rivera and her crew are picking their way toward me, operating under the assumption that I'm unarmed and help isn't coming. FDR runs directly below us. I might be able to drop down and escape, but I don't want to abandon Noah. He'd break his leg at the very least from a fall like that. But if I ditch him after they saw us kissing, they might use him as a hostage. I unclasp my necklace with nervous, fumbling fingers. I've practiced for this scenario, but never encountered it before today. Do you think they're going to rob us? Noah asks, eyeing my disassembly efforts. Hush and close your eyes. You know that ostriches are widely considered the dumbest animals, Noah said. Closing my eyes won't keep us safe. He starts casting around for rubble and grabs a handful of rocks. Heaven help me. I carefully remove several of the purple gemstones and activate each one. I set the faux purple gems on the ground, slide the straps off my necklace and hook them on the edges of the pendant. Now they've been activated, 
each bead will take out anything in a one-foot blast radius. Flat on the ground, Noah. My first shot takes off Lorne's left leg. Pink mist, bomb squads call it. And that's just how it looks. The rounds are made to be almost entirely silent, but they deal maximum damage. It's going to be tremendously painful to regrow that limb, and it'll take days and days. Serves him right for attacking wherever Judica points, including his rightful empress. Rivera and Dietrich each break in opposite directions, but the fourth attacker heads straight for me. He gets one shot off, which grazes my side, before I explode his head. I didn't want to kill him, but he got too close. I might have survived a few more rounds, but Noah can't, and I won't risk his life. Oh my gosh, what just happened? Noah asks. Is that guy dead? No, this is a dream, I say. Noah rubs his eyes, repeatedly. I aim for Rivera next, but just before I release the shot, Noah grabs my arm. Dream or not, look. I follow his finger to the movement behind Rivera. A little girl wearing a red backpack is walking behind her. There's a sign on the faded brick building behind them that reads, Brearley School. The huddling makes even more sense. They had a plan all along. Who would attack them in front of a primary school? If my blasts hadn't been so quiet, the kids would probably be hiding. Why didn't the gunshots in my direction scare them off? What is wrong with New Yorkers? While I hesitate, three more children round the corner. I can't risk another blast. A tiny flash above and to the left alerts me, and I glance up, right at the crosshairs of a sniper trained on my head. I cannot catch a break. I hate that Frederick was right, but this run was a terrible idea. With my back up against the rail, my options have dwindled to one, the river. Frederick is going to kill me, but this is my best bet. I just need to decide whether to bring Noah along. It's a big drop over the rail, and Noah already looks freaked out. They haven't aimed at him once. Hostage risk aside, he's probably safer if I just disappear. I stand up to leap over the rail, because if I'm on the move, they'll probably stay on me. Dietrich fires off another shot while I deliberate. Noah jumps in front of me like a moron, and I yank us both backward into the river. Noah's shoulder in one hand, my necklace in the other. The frigid water slaps against my face, flooding my mouth with salt and sending even more adrenaline into my bloodstream. I release Noah long enough to reclasp my necklace. Then I spin him around. Were you hit? I ask. Noah should not have tried to save me. Clearly, Noah is an idiot. I just hope he's not about to be a dead idiot. I'm not sure they were firing real bullets. Noah's mouth trembles from the cold as he treads water next to me. You seem fine, too. Is it possible we walked into someone filming a movie? I wonder when he'll remember that I exploded someone's leg and another man's head. Maybe he didn't notice. It wasn't a movie, Noah. And if we don't put some space between us and them, they'll keep coming, I say. He bobs his head and starts swimming. I look over my shoulder repeatedly, but don't see them. After I ignore his questions for a while, he stops asking them. Probably because he's either exhausted, freezing to death, or both. When we finally crawl out on the edge of some soccer field, parents and coaches rush over to check on us. I guess even in NYC, two teenagers climbing out of the East River is noteworthy. According to signs, we're on Roosevelt Island. Whoa! A lady holding a bright pink bag and wearing a green Adidas jacket says, Did you two fall in? Are you okay? I'll call 911. No, I say. It's fine. Our parents will ground us for life if they find out. Please don't. She frowns. We have to do something. Noah steps in. It was a dare. You know how goofy high school kids can be. But don't worry, we'll head straight home. It takes him a few more minutes, but Noah calms the parents down admirably. 
By the time he's done, he walks back toward me wearing one donated jacket and holding another in his hand. I slide it on with a grateful smile, even though it smells like Cheetos. At least it blocks the wind. Your name isn't Rebecca, is it? I shake my head. Chancery Alameca. And Laura isn't actually your sister? Another shake. I should have realized that. You look nothing alike. Why aren't you freaking out right now? I ask. He narrows his eyes at me. You're the one who got shot, but remarkably, unbelievably even, you seem fine. Maybe I should be the one asking the vaguely aggressive questions. Fair enough. I wanted to tell him before, and now I have an excuse. But we can't stand around here in the open, waiting for Judica's hit squad to catch up. I start walking toward the north end of the island, and he follows, pelting me with questions. Who are you? He asks. And why don't you appear to be injured? Are we on the set of some movie? Were they firing blanks? Because I thought I saw real blood. And what kind of name is Chancery? I switch to Mandarin, which I assume he speaks. You keep asking who I am, but it's less about who I am and more about what I am. His eyes widen, and he responds in Mandarin. You speak Mandarin, and you're super duper hot. He swallows. Are you? He blinks repeatedly. You're an alien, aren't you? He bites his lower lip, the lip I was just kissing. I laugh. I'm not an alien. But before I explain, what do you know about DNA? DNA? His eyebrows rise. Like adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine? That kind of DNA? Yes, exactly that DNA. Uh, I know that it replicates. Good, I say. What else? Um, it tells our cells what to do, like a blueprint so they can reproduce over and over. Also correct. But here's where we dip into something different. Noah watches me more than the road as we jog toward the Roosevelt Island Bridge. Okay, are you going to tell me? I've never told a human before. His eyebrows rise and he stops. A human? As in you're not human? You've heard of Adam and Eve? He nods. Yep, they've come up. I may not be religious myself, but I have heard of the origin story that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam share. Okay. Well, they aren't wrong. Even the Hindus still have quite a few details right. You've read the Rig Veda, I assume? Noah shakes his head. It doesn't matter, really. But there's a quote in there I liked a lot. Whence all creation has its origin, he, whether he fashioned it or whether he did not, he who surveys it all from highest heaven, he knows, or maybe even he does not. So even some of the Hindus envision a single creator of some sort, whether it's a combination of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, or something else. Okay, sure. It's either that or we came from monkeys, right? Noah shrugs. Actually, evolution posits that we share an ancestor with apes, but not that we came from them. But we're getting sidetracked. The point is that Adam and Eve did live, and they were the first humans. They also had perfect DNA handed to them from the creator. Noah snorts. You think it sounds unlikely, and that's fine. But for me, Adam and Eve were my great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. Let's assume I believe this, which I don't, to be clear, but assume I do. Why is it that you're only a few generations away from good old Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve? I sigh. Their DNA was perfect. With time, the DNA in your body starts to break down, hundreds, thousands, millions of replications later. Then your skin isn't as elastic, your body sags, wrinkles, and so on. You get age spots, and your body doesn't heal quickly. Sure, we all age. I shake my head this time. No, 
We don't all age at the same rate. People are always saying my dad looks amazing for his age. Is that what you mean? Could his dad be half Evian? Maybe, but it's more than looking good. The average human doesn't live more than a hundred years. Okay. I'll live a thousand years, or close to it, before I begin to experience the same aging issues that you'll face in less than 100. Wait, why will you live so long? My DNA is better, I say simply. I heal more efficiently, run faster, process data better, and jump higher than you do. It's not arrogance or superiority that I'm spouting. Those are all facts. We aren't human, which is a word we developed for those with degraded DNA. Those of us with very few genetic deletions call ourselves Evian, from the pure line of Eve. Noah starts walking then, not looking in my direction, hands stuffed in his pockets. We turn on Vernon Road, and he still hasn't said another word. Look, the issue is that our DNA hasn't suffered any decay. But human DNA has through thousands of tiny genetic deletions. He stops and swivels to face me. Deletions? Yes. The very end of the DNA chain drops off the sequence sometimes when cells split. Maybe once every couple thousand replications. Maybe less or maybe more. It's not exact, but that's why we age, remember? Fine, I'll play along. I don't scowl at him. It's natural that he doesn't believe me. Eve's youngest daughter lived as long as Eve, but was born nearly a thousand years after Eve and Adam were created on Earth. Okay, sure. Why not? Her name was Mahalesh, and Alameka was the name of Mahalesh's youngest daughter. She was technically the heir to all that Mahalesh had, or should have been. Alameka was also my great-great-great-grandma. So you're seven generations. Six, I say, cutting him off. I'm six generations removed, or seventh generation myself, from the woman the Bible calls Eve. So you're like super old? I laugh. No, I'm actually 17, just like you. Are you being serious right now? You're some kind of superhuman and you call yourself Evian, like the water? Mom and her weird sense of humor. Yes, like the water. For real? My mother has a warped idea of what's funny. I roll my eyes. She started that company as a joke, but it's kind of taken off and now we're stuck with it. Edom thinks it's hilarious and refuses to drink anything but Evian. Wait, who's Edom? He asks. Right, sorry. Coach Renfro's real name is Edom. Oh, so that guy is one of you? He is like Eve's great-great-grandson. No wonder he looks so old. Noah smirks. Noah, this isn't a joke. It has to be a joke, he says. Because otherwise, I'd have heard something about it. People would know about this. I shake my head. People knew thousands of years ago, but it caused problems. First, humans tried to worship us. That may sound awesome, but it's not. It gets really old. Then people grew envious and attacked us. You heal fast, though, right? His eyes sparkle. He doesn't believe me. Yes, we do. I grit my teeth. Look, I'm not supposed to be telling you. We have very strict laws about this. You could, like, dominate the entire world, but you don't. You hide in the shadows because you're so benevolent? Boy, does he have this wrong. No, nothing like that. I wonder whether this was a mistake. I could stop now and no one would ever believe a word. Heck, he doesn't even believe me. But he's so earnest in his mocking, and he has been so supportive up until now. I plunge ahead. So, here's the deal. My mom was sort of a pioneer, okay? We've been ruling the entire world for millennia, but once we realized how problematic it is to be different, we grew weary of dealing with human tantrums and attacks and whatnot. We developed our own societies outside of humanity, but we... 
I stop. We use them. We use the humans around us because we don't care about them. They have no value to us. How can I say that to him, even though it's true? It sounds so wrong. Which probably means it is wrong. Look, my mom decided that humans would be more helpful, would produce more cheerfully if we provided them with freedom. Noah lifts one eyebrow. Your mother's an altruist? Not exactly. I cringe inwardly. Maybe this will help. Look, hundreds of years ago, Mom had a menagerie. You mean like a zoo? A private zoo. She loved it, but her animals got depressed, right? They moped around, did nothing, and then some of them ate nothing. It got bad enough that they died. Cheetahs first, and then others too. She brought in specialists to figure out what was wrong. She loved the predators most of all. And? And she discovered that while they loved having food provided for them, and they even loved my mother, they hated feeling enclosed. So she created a new park for them with habitats ten times the size of the old ones. What happened? Noah asks. The animals flourished. They bred in captivity. They played, pounced, and thrived. Because they needed freedom. I shake my head. Not quite. They needed the appearance of freedom. Noah frowns. He should frown. Saying this out loud depresses me. Mom realized her humans were suffering in a similar way. They would chafe at the laws, the rules, the demands. They would even refuse to eat, figuratively. She ignored everything her mother taught her, everything her rivals did. She fashioned a new model. She decided to give them a pen that was ten times bigger. She engineered a fake rebellion that made a bunch of the humans think they were in charge. They believed they were free from England. America? I nod. And it worked. They thrived on the appearance of freedom. Noah tosses his hands in the air. America is free. I've seen the elections. People travel wherever they want. They own their own homes and property. I drop my voice to a whisper. They love their really large and spacious pens. Huh? Passports, taxes, bureaucracy. How much do you think humans in America pay in taxes? Noah shrugs. They pay local taxes, state taxes, federal taxes, social taxes, sales taxes. You're saying all of that flows through to you? Of course it does. And some of the humans know it. And some of the others know something is wrong on a subliminal level. Have you heard of pork barrel spending? Humans decry the horrible waste of government. They gripe and do exposés on how terrible it is that so much money just disappears. You guys are pork barrel spending? Of course we are. And on top of that, the highest level humans all know who we are, and they do what we say. Noah shakes his head again. What about the elections? Bigger pen, I say. They're obviously rigged. Do you really think Americans voted for that guy everyone hated so vocally? Come on. I shrug. But humans believe their pen isn't there, so they ignore the fencing when they see it. His mouth drops. Look, some presidents have even come close to blabbing. They've walked a fine line. Like who? Noah's eyes light up. One time, President George W. Bush was on some talk show and someone else had just taken over. People were freaking out and they asked him, aren't you worried about this? His response ticked my mom off, but I thought it was clever. And people didn't credit George W. with a lot of smarts, but that was mostly an act. A very good act, but an act. What did he say? He pointed to the desk in the Oval Office and he said, Don't worry. Whoever occupies that seat behind that desk will quickly find out that their hands are tied and they'll end up doing almost exactly as I have done. He didn't say that. You couldn't possibly recall exactly what he said. I shrug. Look it up. I'm Evian. 
I tap my forehead. Perfect recall. Did he really? Look, the humans all assumed he meant that the checks and balances kept them safe from sweeping change in the executive branch. But that's not what he meant? I tisk. We control all three branches. We can do or change whatever we want. But... Bigger pen, Noah says, his eyes shuddered. You're catching on. And it worked. Mom's holdings and power have only grown because happy humans work harder, produce more, and, well, they thrive. Noah whistles. Except I wasn't kidding when I said my mom died. My throat closes off. On her 900th birthday. Oh, man, he says. I am really sorry. I was hoping that was part of your cover. She was poisoned, I say. She would have lived a few more decades at least if she hadn't been. He stops in the middle of the pass, and a biker almost hits him. He glances my direction and then back at the road. He wants to believe me, but when he's not focused on understanding, his mind rejects it. I get it, I say. You get what? He scowls. I get how this feels. Pardon my rudeness here, but how could you possibly have any idea how I'm feeling right now? I lean on the handrail overlooking the water. When I was five, I finally wondered where beef came from. Huh? I loved tacos, you see. I ate a lot of them. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I insisted on tacos. Beef and sour cream and nothing else. Okay. In Hawaii, a lot of what we eat grows locally. Bananas, pineapples, avocados, papaya. I'd seen it all. I'd even seen cocoa beans. Sure, that makes sense. I knew wheat was ground into flour and formed into tortillas. But I'd never seen a beef plant. So I asked mom where it came from, what kind of plant produced beef. The side of Noah's mouth turns up. That's cute. I didn't find it cute then. When mom told me I was eating a dead animal, my entire world turned upside down. At first, I didn't believe her. That was nonsense. How could we kill animals and eat them? Why would we do that? Who even thought of that as an idea the first time? Well, cheetahs, lions, wolves. Sure, but I hadn't thought it all through, I say. I was shocked and disgusted and in denial. And then your mom explained about veal? I swat his arm. Hilarious and no. I didn't learn about that until last year, and I convinced mom never to serve it again. Horrifying. Look, this is a lot to take in, more than the concept of eating dead things. It is, I say. It's a shift in your entire worldview and your place in the world. Believe me, I get it. Wait, my place? I misspoke, I say. What I meant was, it's a lot to take in. So far, I only have your word to go on, he says. You saw me get shot earlier. You said you did. I saw blood, Noah says slowly. And I thought I saw you get shot. That's true. I shrug my jacket down and show him the bullet hole in the shoulder of my shirt. You did see me get shot. I put my finger through the hole. But our better DNA makes us, well, better. It healed immediately. He raises his eyebrows. Wait, do you mean? He licks his lip. Like it healed in minutes? Seconds. He shakes his head. No way. That can't possibly be true. I know it sounds insane, but think it through. My body does the same things yours can do. I run, I jump, I heal, I think. I just do what you do, faster and better. His mouth opens, but no words come out. Well, it can do a few things yours can't. I hear humans can't regrow fingers, for instance. But you've seen lizards regrow their tails. It's the same concept. No, he shakes his head. Now you sound completely nuts. 
you saw me get shot more than once. I pointed the hole in my sopping wet jeans. The blood washed off in the river, but I took a bullet in my leg too. I raised the side of my shirt and show him the hole there. And here. The injuries healed before I started swimming for safety. Noah switches back to English, maybe without realizing it. When I saw you pull off your necklace and turn it into little bombs you could use to protect us, I thought, this chick is bad, eh? She's kind of crazy, but I like it. I was wrong, though. This isn't awesome. It's unbelievable. And your evidence to support this story is a few holes? He backs away from me as quickly as he can. I'm sorry, but it's not enough. Noah, stop, I say. You have to listen to me. I know it's a lot to process. No, he says. You must have given me something. Acid, LSD, what was it? This is all some kind of whacked out trip. We aren't the only people standing on the Queensboro Bridge, and we're starting to attract more attention than the guy taking a leak on the corner. I look around frantically for anything I can use to prove my point, but I don't see anything. No knives, no rebar, and no glass shards. Where's an empty beer bottle when you need one? I'm going to have to break a bone, which is unnecessarily grotesque, but he's turning around to leave. It's now or never. I scan the bridge quickly to make sure no one is filming us. Thankfully, it's clear. Noah, I say. Wait, I can prove it. He pauses and raises a skeptical eyebrow. How? Go big or go home, I think. Watch. I brace my left arm with my right and slam it down on the railing hard enough that it snaps my radius and ulna both in two. Tears spring unbidden to my eyes, and I whimper. Noah's mouth drops open, and he starts sputtering. I'm worried he may be having a seizure, so I try to calm him down by grabbing his arm reassuringly with my good hand. He looks at me like people on zombie shows look at a shuffling assailant from the undead horde. I let go, and Noah twists and darts around me. I can't really stop him, thanks to my shattered arm. Two seconds, I beg. Just watch this for two seconds. I use my good arm to reduce the breaks, my least favorite part, after which my arm heals swiftly. Noah stares slack-jawed. It's not his best look. Wait, what just happened? His voice is high and squeaky, and his perspiration spikes. I know, it happens so fast it's hard to believe, right? But it still hurts, so please don't make me do it again. This is real, Noah. I'm not lying. He reaches toward my arm, but pauses before actually touching it. He looks up at my face slowly. This is a lot to take in. I understand. Noah's face is pale and between the river leap and the cold, I worry he might be going into shock. Can you hear me, Noah? He scowls. I may not be superhuman, but I hear people fine when they yell. I'm not yelling, but I don't bother defending myself. Do you have any questions? You really are leaving tomorrow? He asks. Nothing I can do to stop you, since you're like Supergirl. I told you my mom died, I say, but I didn't mention that I'm heir to her throne, and I have a twin sister who wants to fight me to the death to take it away. Noah blinks and blinks. Wait, what? He runs his hand through his hair. Does that mean Coach Renfro isn't really your older sister's friend? I roll my eyes. I clue Noah in on the truths of the universe, and he's worried about Edom. Uh, no, I say. Actually, he's sort of my guard, except... I swallow. We're getting married in two days. Excuse me? The old guy? You're marrying him? I sigh. We'll be alive for close to a thousand years. Is this, like, 
an arranged marriage, because he's a real drag. Plus, you didn't seem to mind kissing me. If I were engaged, I definitely wouldn't want my fiance kissing someone like we kissed earlier. He lifts one eyebrow smugly. It's not arranged, no. I bite my lip. He proposed and you accepted, at 17 years old? And what were you doing at Trinity anyway? I turn 18 in a week, okay? And I'm at Trinity for, well, it's a long story. But Edom did ask me, and I agreed. Things are complicated. More complicated than I'm a genetic superhuman who rules the world even though no one has heard of us or seen us? I grin, because this is the Noah I know. Remember the twin sister who I said wanted to kill me? He nods. Well, she's a much better fighter than I am. Our people settle disputes between rulers through mortal combat. We've done it like that for 6,000 years. Mom had named my twin as her successor, but after Mom died, the paperwork had been changed to name me instead. My sister didn't take it well and immediately challenged me. She wants to be empress, and if I lose, I die. If I'm married, I have the option to have my... Uh, Husband, fight for me. Which makes Coach Renfro your meat shield. My eyes roll heavenward. Ridiculous. I'm a pretty good fighter, Noah says. My family starts training us young. I can even use a sword, believe it or not. I'd be willing to fight her for you, even if you don't marry me. I may not be superhuman, but I bet I could beat a girl your size. Yes, I laugh. You seemed pretty impressive back there, lying flat on the ground while I shot the bad guys with ballistic beads and a necklace slingshot. You kicked me down. Regardless, your chivalry is misguided. I can't have someone fight for me unless I marry them first. We turn the corner and begin across the bridge that crosses the East River toward FDR. Noah looks down at the water. You're headed back to your sister's house now. But then what? You fly back to Hawaii or wherever you're really from? I don't have a choice, Noah. There's always a choice. Maybe in your world. Let me rephrase then, he says. Rethink your choice. Don't marry the old guy. Don't kill your sister. I'm kind of sick of America anyway. We can go back to Beijing like you suggested. My dad would be fine with it, I swear. But... Maybe you should tell me your name first. He winks. I told you earlier, it's Chancery Alameca. Right, Chancery, he says slowly, like he's trying my name on for size. I like it. It fits you way better than Rebecca. Five minutes ago, you were practically running away from me screaming. Now I'm supposed to fly to Beijing with you? I had to process everything, he says. The hero gets a minute in stories to find his path. I can save you, and you don't even have to marry me. Not until you're begging to, anyway. I roll my eyes. So the hero in this story is a kid who has to get permission from dad first? I'm quite reassured. But you agree I'm the hero, he says. And you can't leave the hero behind. If you won't go with me to China, take me with you to- Wait. Where are you going? Hawaii, I say. That was true, too. But I can't take you, Noah. It's too dangerous. You could have been killed back there. Or, Edom says, he could be killed right here. I'm not picky. Aw, oh, crap. I've finally been saved, which isn't fantastic news for Noah. Twenty-eight. Edom punches Noah in the face, and I watch, transfixed, as Noah sprawls out on the pavement for the second time today. I shove Edom. What was that for? He tried to save me from drowning. Right after kissing you, Edom says. How do you think I found you two? I watched Frederick's feed until it lost you both, around the time you dove into the East River. 
You should be mad at me, not him. He didn't even know who you were. Edom inhales slowly through his nose. But I can't make myself be mad at you. I just can't. Noah has gotten back up and is holding his fists up in the air. He looks like a 1950s boxer. I roll my eyes. Knock it off, Noah. Apologize, Edom. I'm not apologizing, Edom says, at the exact same time as Noah says, the only thing I'm knocking is his head. My life has devolved into an Acme cartoon. I don't want to deal with it, and I'm suddenly both exhausted and famished. I want to tell Noah goodbye properly, but it's not going to happen with Edom here, so I don't even try. When I climb into the car, Frederick hands me a new phone. Yours was submerged, I believe. I love Frederick. No punching people and no yelling. He just does his job. Edom should take notes. Noah and Edom are still yelling at each other on the sidewalk. What's his problem? I ask Frederick. He loves you, your majesty. It ruins the best of us. He can't possibly love me, not yet. But I get his point. It can't be easy for Edom to watch me kiss another guy, especially now that I've committed to taking his offer. In my defense, the decision is mostly about my otherwise eminent demise. Even so, it's not entirely about that, which means I need to talk to him about it. My replacement phone buzzes in my hands with an all-caps message from Inara. I was wrong, it reads, and a video file is attached. I stick my headphones in and click play. It's grainy, and it's taken late at night. The video is date and time stamped. The person in the corner is talking on the phone just after midnight, less than 16 hours after I set off the EMP. I turn the volume up as high as it goes, and I can still barely make out what the man on camera is saying. But why break things off with her? The shady guy asks. A pause. Of course I don't love her, but it took me a long time to get her to trust me this much. She wants to name me as consort. I put her off to confirm it's what you want. Pause. I never wanted to date her in the first place but I want to make sure that's what you want before I throw away all that work. Another pause. Fine, then what's the new plan? His voice is muffled, but it sounds familiar. A short pause. You can't be serious. Yes, I like her a lot more, admire her even, but they hate each other. That won't ever work. I know this voice. It's low, it's rumbly, but I know it if I can just place it. Another long pause. Your intel better be right, because I'm the one risking my neck. What you're telling me makes no sense. A short pause. Yes, okay, I told you that already, but I- The shady man goes quiet again. Fine, I got it. Another pause. I said okay. If she's awake, I'll do it now. If not, I'll do it first thing tomorrow. He hangs up and glances around the hall, his face briefly coming into view of the camera before the video cuts off. Of course I know the voice. I just didn't want to believe it. The shady guy is Edom. Inara's cryptic message. She's telling me I shouldn't make Edom my consort. How could I, after watching that? Who was he talking to? When Edom finally gets in the car, I shift to face the window. He sits on the opposite side and doesn't look at me either. I watch as we drive away from Noah, who looks heartbroken. I put my hand to the window and he waves back, as if we're going to see each other in the morning. Except I know we won't. It hurts to drive away from one of the only people I know likes me because of who I am, instead of my genetic code. Unfortunately, without any conversation, I have to think about what happened in the past few hours. Someone, almost certainly Judica, attacked me. 
the fact that it happened hours after I decided to name Edom my consort can't be a coincidence. Only four people knew about my recent decision. Inara, Lark, Alora, and Edom. This morning, I trusted all four of them almost unconditionally. But one of them probably told Judica. The question is, which one? The one who seems the most likely is also the one who makes the least sense. Edom stands to gain a lot when I name him consort. If he's sure he can defeat her, why would he betray me? Unless he's been working for Judica all along. But that video. He broke up with Judica the next morning, just like the video indicated he would. Which means the odds he's somehow playing me against her are low. He's working for someone else. Edom's loyalties are split. How did I not see that before? Could he have killed Mom? I lean my head against the glass, my heart contracting painfully. I don't know who he was talking to, but I don't think he's working for my twin. I'll have to put a pin in the question of who he called for now. One betrayal at a time. I consider Inara next. She's the one sending me incriminating information on Edom, as if to cast suspicion elsewhere. Video can be doctored, of course, but it's hard, time-consuming work. And his voice confirmed the face, not the other way around. Inara stayed behind with Judica. I thought she was risking herself for me, but for all I know, she's been working against me all along. She's been sending me videos under the radar, helpful videos. But maybe Judica approved each one. I think about the videos, their content, and I doubt it. Anara did follow me to my room immediately after Mom's death. But if Judica murdered Mom, and if Anara knew, there's no telling what plan they hatched in advance. My brain scans through thousands of interactions with Anara all of them positive. Could she really have been hatching plots all along? I can't keep thinking about it, so I move along. I see no way that Alora benefits from selling me out to Judica. There are too many angles, and until very recently, I wasn't even paying attention. I have zero agents, no advisors, and not a clue what to do. I can't even think about Lark. She has no contacts, none that know she's alive, and she stands to gain nothing. Judica hates her. Or worse, doesn't consider her at all. She's the lowest likelihood of betrayal. But she can't help me either, for the same reasons. I drop my face in my hands. Edom shifts on the seat and pulls me closer, slinging his arm around me. Relieved isn't a strong enough word for how I feel about you being okay. I should never have let you go to school alone today. Please forgive me. I turn toward him, his arms pulling me even tighter, and I sob against his broad chest the rest of the way home. By the time we reach Alora's brownstone, I feel better. I shouldn't let him comfort me, because I don't know who Edom is, not really but my body still trusts him. He's done nothing but protect it, always. When I walk up the steps and through the doors at Alora's, an old friend greets me. She towers over Alora and me both, standing at eye level with Edom. Her skin shines, almost as dark as the color of black calla lilies. The combination of dark skin and russet hair makes the emerald sparkle of her eyes even more startling. I run toward her, my arms outstretched. She envelops me in a reassuring bear hug. Marcel! Little dove. My mom's old endearment from her field lieutenant for her spy network brings a tear to my eye. I wipe it away quickly. Not that I'm happy to see you, but why are you here? I ask. Is everything okay? Our chef back home, Angel, has run my mom's spy network for hundreds of years. But Marcel is my mom's second. 
She implements whatever Angel commands in the United States, anyway. Is everything okay with Melina? Marcel's stationed in Austin, where my other full sister lives. I've never met Melina, presumably because she caused so much trouble before I was born. She hasn't been welcome in Niihau since. Marcel was tasked to Austin full-time a few years ago, because Melina had attracted so many exiled Evians from other families. Mom thought a stronger Alameca presence was prudent. Marcel shakes her head. All is quiet on that front, thankfully. But there's something else. Your mother called me the day she died. She told me she wasn't sure how things would play out, but that she might need to pass her network. Monarchs don't usually pass their network along. Typically, an heir develops her own network over a period of years from a core group of people she can trust. I should have vetted and placed each of my spies myself, allowing me to determine the reliability of each person as events transpire. But I didn't think I needed one. Which Mom knew, and that's probably why Marcel is here. She's my mom's last gift. Which means I need to make sense of Mom's final words. She said I need her key code, and the clue she provided was, the one I love more than any other. Does she mean the one person mom loves more than any other? Or who I love more than any other? Or does she mean a thing, like control of the family? Or something more esoteric, like security? I'm a little conceited, I suppose. Because if it's who my mom loves, I assume it's me. It wouldn't be chancery, though. That's too obvious. Perhaps Chansey? Or maybe Little Dove? But Marcel just called me that. She wouldn't have used the key code so casually, would she? Or maybe she was helping me, putting the thought in my head. My brain throbs, and I don't know how all this works. I wish things could be simple for once. A sick thought occurs to me. Could my mom have meant Sotiris? Did she love her unborn child more than me already? Can you pardon us for a moment? I ask Edom and Alora. Marcel and I need to talk. Marcel follows me to my room, and I don't waste any time. You need the key code. She nods. I didn't think we should do this over the phone. Also, I fear that Angel may be compromised, I say. Marcel's shoulders droop. I've reported to and worked with her for more than 400 years. We were in the field together on our first assignment. I don't want to believe it, but she's the best chef I've ever known, which helped her get a lot of positions over the years, and she watches everything that leaves her kitchen like a hawk. I can't see how any of her food could have been poisoned without her knowledge. Sometimes we don't know people as well as we think. I loved her. Marcel says, like a sister. My jaw tightens. Unfortunately, I've learned that trust doesn't always go hand in hand with affection. You're still so young, Marcel says, but you're not wrong. What do you need from me? I ask. Just the key code. If your mother intended to pass you her network, she'd have given it to you. How many chances do I have? because I have a few ideas. Two, she says. Otherwise, people could just guess and guess forever. Two gives you one mistake. I almost can't bring myself to say the word, but I have to know. Please, Mom, let this be wrong. So, Tiris. Marcel shakes her head. I sigh in relief. Mom couldn't have expected me to guess something bizarre, like security or world peace. She must have meant a person, and it must be me. Now I need to figure out whether it's chancy, chancery, or divinity. I don't think Marcel would have called me Little Dove if that was the code, so I rule that out. And both chancy and chancery are too obvious. Divinity, I say. Marcel smiles. Correct. And we have a lot to talk about. First and foremost, what's Judica been up to while I've been gone? She sent the members of each of the five families home about two seconds after you left. 
I expected that. Go on. There's a lot of movement from them. I imagine several of them would support you, including the second family, Melissa. As you know, the last ruler of Melissa, Senna, didn't have many sons, just like your mother didn't have many daughters. And now that she's dead and her daughter, Annalessa, is ruling, she hasn't had many sons either. When she heard Edom followed you, suddenly it clicks. Annalessa, Edom's sister, hasn't had many sons, and neither did Edom and Annalessa's mother, Senna. I didn't know that. My mom struggled with the guilt of selling her sons, and she had a lot. But if you only had a few, selling them off would be even more difficult. You might even keep one. If that son was only three when you died and your daughter came to power, she might sell him so that other families would sell their sons to her when she had an heir to raise. But if that daughter didn't have any sons either, she might gain a new understanding. She might even regret doing it. She might try to bring him back to her side. And if that brother thought the sale of children was barbaric, if he raged inside over the betrayal, who knew whether he'd agree? The phone call had to be from his sister, Annalessa, or someone else from the second family. I would bet on it. The question is whether he's loyal to Alameca, and by extension to me, or to them. There's a reason sons are sold at birth. With our Evian memories, even three years can result in shifted alliances and skewed loyalties. When I finally start to listen again, Marcel is talking about the other families and what our agents say about who they support. I want to hear all of this, but not right now. You're putting off something big and I don't have time for delays. What is it? Marcel looks surprised. You're right. I didn't mean to put it off, but it frightens me. Judica may officially be ruling in your place, but she's not acting like it. She wants to set the tone for her rule. She means to unite the six, according to prophecy, she says. She wants to rename Alameca the seventh family once it's done. She says the uniting of all Evians under one ruler would explain the obscure references in various texts to the seventh family. If she's going to show the other families she's strong, she needs to make a statement. Once she has chosen a way to proceed as the new leader, she'll need to tie up loose ends. Hence the hit team on me. If she can't be completely positive she can defeat me in the ring because I might choose Edom, she'd send her people for me. What I know of Judica, and what I've seen of her current actions, tells me her next step. Queens through the millennia have usually started off their rule in the way they mean to move ahead. Judica discussed her plan with my mom a million times. Before Marcel can say it, I guess. She's launching a nuclear bomb against China. Marcel's mouth opens and then closes. She nods. I can't wait until the end of my ten days. I need to go back now or millions of innocent people will die. Twenty-nine. I dismiss Marcel and rush from my room to arrange a flight home. But I end up standing in the hallway like an idiot. Whose plane do I use? Bellatrius and Arlington's presence by my door reminds me. I never even asked Frederick if my guards all survived the attack. Was anyone injured? I ask. Bellatrius bobs her head. Simeon sustained a sliced hamstring and recovered quickly. And Ralph? He lost his hand and is in the process of regrowing it, Arlington says. And being a baby about it, too. Bellatrius smirks. Men do have a tendency to whimper more. Some men, Arlington huffs. But not all. I glance from Bellatrius to Arlington, both of whom stare at me expectantly. Arlington serves me because he's grateful I spared his sister. Bellatrius serves me because I voted for her to be able to leave the family. I had no idea either of them cared about my opinion at the time. Or that's why I think they're here. Bellatrius, why did you follow me? 
Everyone knows Judica's stronger, fiercer, and more powerful. Why pick the losing side? Her eyes widen. You're not weaker. You're merciful. The two aren't the same. How do you figure? I ask. She shifts and crosses her arms. When I fell in love with Petirin, it was a mistake. We never should have met. I love Alameca, Your Majesty. I love my family. But Petirin loved Shanoa, too. And sometimes someone has to be willing to bend. And you were willing to bend. Exactly, she says. And I could have run away with him like he asked. I could have abandoned my family. Our families were at war, so I knew Shanoa would have granted me asylum. Why didn't you? I ask. She swallows hard. Because I wanted to do things the right way. I believed I would be granted permission to go, and so I requested it. But your request was denied. I recall the hearing perfectly. Your mother and sister didn't care at all for me or my future. They only cared about the family. Belatrius looks at her feet. That's their job, I say softly, to protect the family. The family is made up of individuals, Belatrius says. She's quoting me. I advocated for allowing her to go, because our highest calling is not to protect a group, but each person. We're more to you than soldiers in an army, she says. And that's why I'm here. And that's why Ralph shouldn't be whimpering over an injury justly taken protecting you. It's an honor to be one of your guards, your majesty. The singular honor of my life. I am utterly unworthy of that kind of devotion. You're free to go to Shanoa, I say. I need guards, but I need citizens who aren't in pain more. You may leave and join Petirin with my blessing. Belatrius shakes her head. I'll never leave your service, your majesty. My anger over that decision faded, and Petirin moved on. I'm excited to be a part of this. I want to create a new dynamic within Alameca under your direction. If I can even reach Hawaii alive to deal with Judica in the first place, who can I trust? Will I ever know? I'm suddenly exhausted, but there isn't time for me to collapse in a heap and sob. It's my job to try and stop my sister before she can kill untold innocents in a nuclear blast. I flog my tired brain. The facts are pretty simple. I decided to make Edom my consort and let him fight for me. And I told Inara, Lark, Alora, and Edom. Then I left for school. Lark conveniently had plans and wasn't accompanying me. Then, on my way home, I was ambushed. I've ruled out Edom in betraying me to Judica, probably, but he's clearly answering to someone, most likely his sister. Did one of the three tell Judica my plans? Or did they tell someone else who told her? Or did someone bug my conversation with Inara? Or perhaps Judica realized how likely the scenario was without a heads up from anyone and decided to attack. The timing could have been coincidental. Occam's razor would indicate it was Inara, Lark, or Alora. But I trust them all. And now I suspect them all, too. I don't have enough information right now, so I decide to focus on my immediate problem, transportation. I could call Inara and ask her to send me a plane. But if she betrays me, I'll never land alive. The plane could crash on the way, killing me and eliminating the threat. I might survive a plane crash depending on how it goes down, but not if the person who orchestrated it has people standing by to decapitate me while I'm vulnerable. If I ask Alora, I'm in the same predicament. Edom doesn't have a plane, not that I'd trust it if he did. If Lark had a plane, maybe. But she doesn't. My life is a mess. I can only think of one person who might have access to a jet and who has no loyalties to my sister or anyone else. I text Noah before I can second-guess my instincts. Any chance I could borrow a jet? 
Turns out Hawaii is too far to go by rowboat. The little dots show up, but then disappear. I stare at my phone for two minutes, and he still doesn't reply. Maybe he needs to think. Or even worse, he may need to ask his dad for permission. Ugh. The door to Edom's room opens, and I drop my phone guiltily. What did Marcel want? Edom asks. She was one of your mom's intelligence officers, wasn't she? Clearly a well-hidden asset, I joke. Edom shrugs. I was number two on your mom's security team until Judica drafted me to run hers. I worked for Marcel for a while. Besides, the lieutenants are usually more of an open secret. Duh. Is she still here? He looks past me toward my doorway. Uh, no. I sent her downstairs so I could think. Can we talk then? I don't know, I say. Can we? He glances behind me at Bellatrius and Arlington. In private? I incline my head and he precedes me into my room. I close the door with a click. What's up? I sit on my bed. Edom grabs the chair from my desk and sets it by the bed so he's eye level with me. Whoa, this is serious, I joke. He doesn't smile and my stomach flip-flops. What do you want to talk about, Edom? I just received some urgent news. Why are you kissing Noah? I look around the room. Am I? I thought I was talking to you. You know what I mean. I do. You mean, why did I go to school today, and why do I like him when I obviously also like you and have agreed to take you as my consort, right? He nods. I'm actually impressed with how calm and composed he is. Feelings are complicated, I say. I like you a lot, Edom. But I like Noah, too. He's different. He represents a desire I've had for a long time to escape, to be free. But you chose to return, and you know that I'll take care of you. He reaches over and takes my hand. Do you doubt that? I don't doubt his intention. He looks utterly sincere. I think back to the videos of him with Judica. He looked like a robot, stiff, disconnected, and so formal it was unreal. He's not like that with me. But that's not the only video of him I've seen lately. And the other one generated significantly different emotions from me. Why did you break up with my sister? I need to know. Even more than details about his connection to the Melissa family, I need to understand what happened between them. Because if he doesn't have a real reason for dumping her, then he really is just a puppet for someone else. He never releases my hand. I'm surprised this didn't come up before. I assumed maybe you wanted to pretend it never happened. What did happen? I ask. From the videos I saw, it didn't look like you had much of a relationship. I haven't hidden from you my feelings about the Evian royal model. It's broken, he says. I decided when I was still a teenager, and you and Judica weren't even ten, that my best chance of changing things was to rise to a position of leadership. I trained as hard as I could, and I did everything anyone asked of me. I worked harder, longer, and with more ferocity than anyone else. I heard that, I say. Balthazar talked about you sometimes. He called you his young lion. He frowns. I was assigned to keep you safe when you were a child. I was young too, and it seemed in keeping with my skill set. I only did that for a year before I was promoted and I moved up. Eventually, I was assigned to train the other boys your mother purchased from other families. Luckily, there weren't many new ones, since you and Judica were older. Around the time you turned 13, they sent me into the field. I worked with Marcel for a few months, and with a few other operatives too. I did okay, but I wasn't nearly as good at spying as I am at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not a good spy, huh? I guess not, since his phone call got caught on video. When I came home, you had both just turned 17. I was assigned to train Judica. Balthazar wanted to be able to watch her fight instead of participating himself. 
I know this sounds bad, but I think he's getting older and having trouble healing as fast. In any case, within a few months of that, Judica requested that I be assigned as captain of her personal guard. I know all of that, I say. What I want to know is, I know. You want to know when and how Judica and I started. Look, from the time I got back, I knew I wanted to take Balthazar's position. At the time, Judica was focused on a guy named Xander. Fifth family, good guy. One day, Balthazar assigned me to spar with him. I beat him in under a minute. Judica stopped talking to him the next day. She only wanted the best, and I understood and respected that. I won't lie, I wanted to be named consort. It seemed like the one job more powerful than head of security to which I could aspire. Not that it's a job, but you know what I mean. Go on. When I started training with her, I wanted to like her. I wanted to, well, I wanted to want her, but I just didn't. When she touched me, I flinched. The way she spoke to me. His lips compress. She was kinder to death. Everything about her felt wrong to me. I knew what I wanted when I was alone, and I'd resolve again to make it work. I'd convince myself it couldn't be that bad. But when she came near, I froze up. After a while, I just couldn't do it anymore. And that day when she almost killed you, I wanted to end her. My hands shook from the effort of not cutting her throat. Uh, that's a little scary. Edom grabs my other hand, too. That's when I realized that I liked you. And I tried to project my feelings for you onto Judica. But when we were around each other, I couldn't do it. She's not like you, not at all. It upset me for years that no one ever stood up for you. I watched her bully and abuse you while your mom just watched. You could have done something about it, but you never did either. Once I realized how I felt about you, I dumped her. He doesn't mention the late night phone call. I don't know why I thought he might come clean, but it bums me out way more than it should when he doesn't. I pull my hands away from his. That was the only reason? Edom sits up and stares at me intently. I screwed up. He's too smart for direct questioning. And I suck at subterfuge. The video camera was live, wasn't it? I nod. He sighs heavily. I came to live in Alameca at the age of three and a half. I wasn't the only boy who struggled, but I was the only one who remembered something different, who had a family he knew. When Annalesa approached me at one of your mother's birthdays, I was only 10. Annalesa deeply regretted selling me. She said she was young and thought she had no choice. She told me she tried to buy me back, but your mother refused. Annalesa asked if she could call me from time to time. She wanted to help, to make up for her mistake. And she offered to guide me if I was interested. And you agreed? I ask. Edom hangs his head. I knew love, and then it was gone. I missed my mother still, and I wanted someone to care about me. None of which excuses what I did. He clenches his fists and looks me in the eye. Yes, I've been talking to her regularly since then. When did she start telling you what to do instead of guiding you? He closes his eyes and exhales. It was easier to let someone else call the shots, someone older who I thought wanted me. I was 20 when I told her no the first time but she threatened to send evidence of our discussions to Enora if I refused her. I've wanted to tell you ever since we left Niihau. It's such a relief that you know. You didn't seem too happy about coming along. Maybe once my mom died, your orders changed and my taking you got in the way. Edom stands up. Nothing like that. I was upset that you forced my hand because everyone has forced my hand my entire life. It didn't take long for me to realize that what you did wasn't the same. You thought you were helping. And once I told you I was mad, your reaction was to apologize. I swear to you, 
I haven't talked to my sister since I left Hawaii, nor do I ever care to again. Did Annalesa tell you to stay there and beg Judica's forgiveness? Or did she tell you to come with me? I don't know what she would have said, Edom says, because I haven't spoken to her since that night when she ordered me to do what I already wanted to do and dump your sister. And for the record, she heard news that your mom was changing her airship. I have no idea who her other contacts were, but her order wasn't why I did it. I'd been wanting to break up with her since we started dating. So you did do as she directed. He laughs. I'm sure she's furious now, as I haven't called or checked in with her since that night. Does that bother you? I ask. With a little perspective, I realized she was using me all along. She never once in 16 years asked how I felt or what I wanted. And she only called when she needed something. Edom has been committing treason for 16 years. I should be angry. I should feel outraged. But I don't. My heart just hurts. How can I trust anything he says to me now? Where's the line between a sister contacting her brother and a spy? Edom's right. Our system is broken. Daughters killing mothers and sisters, siblings using one another, buying and selling babies. It's all so wrong that we don't even realize how wrong anymore. The only reason we don't see it is that we're all born into it. A single tear trails hotly down my cheek. I know your mom's gone, Chancery, but you're not alone. You don't trust me now, and I don't blame you. It may take me a long time to convince you of this truth, but I'm on your side until the day I die. For years, I thought I needed to change Evian society alone. My success or failure would be limited to what I could accomplish myself. But now I believe in someone else, someone who is uniquely poised to repair everything that's broken. Think what we could do together. And if you united the families behind these changes, we could redirect the course of the entire world. A chill runs down my arms. His words echo my mom's eerily. I don't know whether to believe in his loyalty to me, but heaven help me, I want to so badly. What if I've changed my mind, I ask. What if I can't choose you as my consort anymore? Will you support me then? Edom's eyes widen, but he nods. I will. Whatever you decide. But I'll never forgive myself for putting you in danger this way. You didn't even confess. I caught you. His nostrils flare. True. You're not going to tell me I'm making a mistake if I don't choose you? I'm not, he says. And if that's your decision, we'll hit it hard over the next two days to give you your best chance. I smirk. No more terminal cancer patient analogies? I'm sorry for that. I really don't want to lose you. You know, for someone who may be the best fighter alive right now, you sure seem to be afraid a lot. Not really, he says. Losing you through my own stupidity or losing you through your sisters. Those are basically the only things that concern me. Well, that and sharks. I mean, have you ever tuned in during Shark Week? They never stop growing teeth. Rows and rows of teeth. And they never sleep. He shudders. I can't quite help a tiny smile. My phone bings and I glance at it. Noah finally replied. I got the go-ahead. When are we leaving? Tell me we aren't bringing the old man along. I tap back a reply. How many seats in your jet? Twenty-two. I smile. Good news? Edom asks. You said we could hit it hard for two days. He nods. What could you do in a few hours? Excuse me? He asks. Judica's planning on nuking China to show the five she's tough and keep them from encroaching on her territory. 
before I'm scheduled to return. Edom groans. And you don't want me as your consort anymore, so you'll be fighting her yourself. When he says it, I realize it's true. It's not that I don't want him. I do. I actually believe him. I came into this discussion not knowing whether I could trust him at all. After talking, I believe his concern for me is sincere. He really does want to protect me. I even agree that our system is broken. I may choose him one day, but not today. Besides, if I make him my consort now, I'll never know whether I'd have chosen him without the pressure of Judica hanging over me. If I do survive, I don't want that kind of desperation and doubt hanging over my marriage for a thousand years. My mom died, leaving a huge power vacuum in her wake. Judica has been spawning stories of her ferocity and competency for years. And yet Judica feels like she needs to bomb China to grab the attention of the five and shore up her rule. There may very well be empresses who use their consort to fight every single battle. They may even be well-respected. But I don't have that luxury, because I don't have the stomach to bomb another country or win a big war. And I already have a reputation for being weak. If I want to protect Alameca and keep our family safe from encroachment, I need to do something big, something that shows the world I'm different than my reputation. Taking a tough consort might keep me alive, but if I want to have any chance of changing things, I can't just survive. Edom may never understand. I may be ruining any hope of ever being with him. I need to thrive. That's why I've got to take Judica down or die trying. Edom compresses his lips and closes his eyes. But when he opens them, he says, I'll do whatever you need. In that moment, I may be breaking off our engagement, but I've never wanted to kiss him more. Thirty. I replace the missing stones in my necklace the second Edom leaves my room to pack. The use of my last resort ballisti makes me think. My list of powerful allies is short. Alora and Inara. Of course, Edom, the guards who followed me, Noah and Lark are also on my side. And power and prestige aren't everything. Unfortunately, I can't really trust any of them either. I need to figure out who betrayed me to Judica, because next time I may not survive it. I almost call Lark up to my room, but I hesitate. She's the one person, other than my mom, who I'd have trusted to support me blindly without a scintilla of doubt on any point. Until my mom executed hers, and I did nothing to stop it. Until my mom ordered her execution, and only allowed her to survive in secret. I don't think Lark blames me, but I'm not entirely positive. Which leaves me puzzling out the politics and loyalties of my wannabe allies alone. Even if I'm wrong about Edom, and he is still in contact with his sister, I don't think I'm in imminent danger from her. I doubt she sees me as a threat. In fact, Maybe the only universal thing in my favor right now is that, to the rest of the world, I'm the weaker ruler. That means the other empresses would likely pick me over Judica to ascend the throne, because in their minds I'll be easier to control, intimidate, and ultimately defeat. Of course, there's always a chance that my affection for and attraction to Edom has clouded my judgment. I shake my head and move on to Inara. She's been mom's right hand as long as I can recall. She has also been like a second mother to me. And when mom died, I saw the pain it caused her. She wanted to leave with me, but she stayed back to defend me from afar at no small risk to herself. I also can't think of a single reason Inara would want to harm me. She knows I'd keep her in the same position, managing many of the Alameca affairs. 
I doubt Judica would do the same. And I'd rely more on her advice than my twin, too. Plus, I think Anara likes me more. And it's not as if eliminating Judica or me would land her the throne. Our older sister Melina would snatch that crown so fast our heads would spin, from what I've heard. Which brings me to Alora. I can't think of any reason she might want me dead. Judica, Melina, and Inara would all have to die before Alora would be in line for the throne. And she's never seemed to have any interest in it. Even so, I should talk to her before I leave. She has the least cause of all to harm me, and I trust her opinion the most. I throw the rest of my belongings in a bag and race downstairs. I find her in the library, surrounded by books and busy reading one. I clear my throat and she looks up. I dive right into the important part. Marcel brought urgent intel. Judica's planning to bomb China before my return. That's terrible. Alora snaps the book closed. She's eager to make a name for herself. It's a little more complicated than that. As you know, we control both Cuba and the United States. Evians all know that, but humans don't, which of course includes China. Mom always made Judica propose plans for what she'd do to establish herself when Mother died. Alora leans back in her chair and looks at the ceiling. I had to do the same. In Judica's most recent plan, we send a bomb from Alaska, disguised as a bomb from Russia. China might reject the United States' offer of aid, but it would accept aid from Cuba. Either way, Russia looks like the bad guy, and the bombing allows her a way to slide in seamlessly and begin to develop influence in sections of China. Of course, Lainina is going to be pissed since it implicates her holdings. Alora stands and pulls her phone from her pocket. I take it this moves up our timeline. I'll call Phil and let him know we need the jet. I shake my head. I need you here. If this goes badly, you won't want to be anywhere near Judica. Trust me. At least I don't have to worry about you, she says. I will anyway, but not nearly as much. She still thinks Edom's fighting for me. Actually, I decided to fight her myself. Alora gulps. Why? Mom never made me run drills for what I'd do to prove myself, but even if she had, I'd never have come up with something that murdered millions of people. Humans, Alora says. There aren't any Evians in China, at least not sanctioned ones. They're still people, I say disappointed that even Alora cares less about humans. Fair enough. Since I can't do something that splashy, I'll need to do something else to set the tone of my reign. I shove down my uncertainty and doubt. I can do this. I have to do this. I'm going to take down the biggest dog in the place, who also happens to have murdered our mother. Two birds with one uh, sword, as the case may be. Alora sinks into her wingback desk chair with a whomp. I perch on the edge of the wooden chair facing her desk. You lied before. You don't think I can do it. Alora looks down at her hands. I should tell you something about melodics. It's effective. And if you've started to hear melodic lines, it might even be enough. But you know I won the Centennial Games 120 years ago. What you don't know is how I won. Alora stands up and removes a book from the second highest shelf in the room. She plunks it down on the table, flips it open to a page, and points at a large, glossy, black and white photo. Believe it or not, this was a pretty impressive bit of technology at the time. I glance down at the photograph of the Alameca Centennial Games team. Alora is wearing a smart black dress with divided skirts, and her hair is pulled back into a severe bun. She flips the page and shows me an image of the Lenora team. She points at a kid near the front. This was who I fought in my first match. She looks ten years old! She laughs. Not quite, but she should have been an easy win. I was nervous, and she was so young that we'd never even met socially. 
She was a nobody, barely even selected to enter. She was a last-minute substitution for another candidate who became unsuitable. Everyone knew that round was a given for me, Chancery. She was 23rd generation. Alora closes her eyes, reliving the match in her mind. She exhales and opens her eyes. And she almost beat me. Like my match with Lark, I imagine. No one even considered I might win the tournament after that near miss. Even worse, after bumbling my way through my first match, I had very bad luck. My next fight was against one of the top contenders, a man I had actually dated. I knew him very well. He was a much better fighter than me, and everyone knew it, including Vaughn. Wait, you fought someone from Alameca? I ask. Alora clucks. You haven't been to the games yet, but they don't care what family you're from. You're matched up randomly until the finals. Wow. So if I went, I could fight Judica, Edom, and Lark. Alora lifts her eyebrows. Lark isn't eligible. Duh. Well, Judica could have to fight Edom then, just like you fought your ex. Precisely. And the point is that I should have lost Chansey. He should have destroyed me. Did he let you win? She shakes her head. We ended badly, and he was angry. I am absolutely positive he did not let me win. No, I won because I knew him extremely well. Maybe better than he knew himself. I knew everything about him. His pain, his pride, his anger, his joy, his every motivation. I heard his melodic line with total clarity. I anticipated every single move and wasn't off by a note. So I need to know Judica? I groan. She's the devil! We're twins. We have identical DNA, but for 17 years I've tried to guess how she'll react, and I'm never right. If I think up, she goes down. I'm not even kidding, Alora. The other day, she stabbed me with a fork at breakfast for no reason. That may have been the case a month ago, she says. But now you have more in common. And I think you're looking at the past with new eyes. I hope it has given you more insight. I shake my head. I just don't know. Chancery. After I defeated Vaughn, I went on to fight more amazing, talented fighters. I researched each one of them, compiling everything I knew. I watched them fight whenever I could. I managed to beat them, one after another. But my last fight was against the man who had won every single Centennial Games for 700 years, my uncle. My mouth drops. I thought he had simply stopped competing. I didn't know he'd lost. How did you beat Balthazar? I heard he was unbeatable. He should have been. I thought my ex-boyfriend would beat me for sure, and I was delighted when I won. But I knew in my bones I couldn't defeat Balthazar. I had learned in fighting Vaughn that to win, I needed to know the person. No one alive knew Balthazar better than Mother. They'd been dear friends for almost 800 years. I spent hours talking to Mother about him. Then I watched Balthazar talk to her. Mother told me a lot, but I discovered something when I watched them together. What? I'm sitting on the edge of my seat, leaning toward her. Balthazar was in love with her. Not admiration, not high regard, not major consideration for her feelings, not respect for a great ruler. He was in love. Once I figured that out, his life choices and consequently his melodic line became utterly understandable. If I hadn't puzzled out something no one else knew, including our mother, and possibly Balthazar himself, I never could have won that match. What are you saying? Alora walks around the desk and takes my hands in hers. Chancy, you can beat her but you need to know Judica better than she knows herself. And hating her won't get you there. You need to understand her. 
Edom may want to practice today on the flight, and that's fine. But if you are hearing melodic lines, your most critical preparation will take place in here. She taps the side of my head. Footsteps sound near the door. I stand up. Come in, I say. Lark's head peeks around at us. I hadn't contemplated that I'll have to leave her. If things go badly, I'll never see her again. Promise you'll take care of her, I whisper to Alora. Take care of me, Lark asks. Clearly, I need to work on my volume levels. I'm headed back today. Judica's moving ahead in my absence in ways I can't allow, so I'm fighting her myself. Lark frowns. I'm coming along. You can't, I say. Mom ordered your execution, and we let everyone believe it took place. You must stay here and develop into the asset I know you can be. She shakes her head vehemently. You need me by your side. She squares her shoulders. You don't have that many people you can trust. I'm not even sure she's on that list, but I want her to be, badly. It's too risky for you. I don't care. She sets her jaw, and I know she means it. All the times I slid my eggs onto her plate and dragged her along for jogs and swam with dolphins in the surf and painted our toenails together, slam into my mind like a wave to the face, surprising, overwhelming, and refreshing. I can't leave her here alone, not after all we've been through. She'd be safer, but life isn't worth living because it's safe. If that's what you want, I say. I do, she says. I want to be with you. Then you better grab your bags. Lark rushes out the door, and I follow her to grab my things. Edom's waiting outside, and he insists on carrying my stuff. Even if he's not my consort, he's nice to have around. Alora meets us at the door to see us off. Do you want me to come with you? She asks. I pull her tightly against me. No, I want you here, safe, because I don't know how this will go down, but Judica won't be happy you supported me. I'm worried enough already. I can take care of myself. The glint in Alora's eye is one I've never seen, but I believe her. There's more to my older sister than I realized. A long black suburban pulls up behind the black sedan. What's that? I ask. You said the jet were taking seats 22, Frederick says. Right, I say. Well, by my count, that leaves enough room for all the guards we came with, Frederick says. And I plan to fill every seat belt. You aren't heading home alone. On the drive over to the plane home, Edom can't stop talking. Something about the knowledge I'm about to fight Judica has knocked a screw loose in his head. Another thing I forgot to mention he says, is that I cut him off in the middle of his 14th tip. Eat him. His mouth clicks shut. I appreciate your desire to help. I put my hand over his. But I'm making you nervous. I lean back in my seat and close my eyes. This fight won't be won or lost from tips or tricks. I think about Alora's words. I need to win it in my head. I need to understand the enigma. Which means I'm probably going to die. Edom flips his hand over and wraps it around mine. You will do it. I believe you can, truly. Do you not trust Alora? Lark asks. Is that why we're taking Noah's jet? I glance up at Bernard and widen my eyes. Lark splutters. Of course I trust Alora, I say. I just don't want to give Judica any more cause to blame her if- No, Edom says. No talking like that. And we're sure of Noah? Lark asks. Because we don't know him at all. I glare at Lark and Edom. What? Edom protests. I didn't even say anything. You thought it, I say. 
I think we can all agree he's human, and he was genuinely shocked when I told him about Evian's. I wasn't there, Edom says, so I can't speak to that. But I don't trust him, not a bit. Duly noted, I refuse to fall back into the tangle of self-doubt over who to trust. It's quicksand. We're here, Bernard says. I'm relieved to be diverted from my deliberations. Even if he's not coming with us, interacting with Noah is always distracting. I climb out of the sedan and tell Bernard goodbye. When I turn away from the car, Noah's smiling at me from the doorway of the hangar. My heart lurches at the sight of his grin. I didn't think I'd see it again. Thanks for loaning us your jet, Edom says. I'm proud of him for making an effort to be civil. Sure, happy to help, Noah says. Plus, a trip to Hawaii is always fun. Edom bristles. You're not coming. Of course I am, Noah says. It's my jet. I shake my head. You need to get back to school, and where we're going, it's not a vacation. No way. Noah crosses his arms. I'm coming. It's my one stipulation to the loan. Edom rolls his eyes. Look, kid, I understand you're upset, but that doesn't mean you can follow us into a hostile environment. You annoy me, but I don't want you dead. Why should I care whether Evians are there? Noah asks. We're gods compared to you, Edom says. Noah clenches his fists. Edom lifts one eyebrow casually, and the corner of his mouth turns up into a half grin. Are you trying to look threatening right now, Cream Puff? Look, I say, we're not trying to be jerks, but- Edom interrupts me. A 10-year-old Evian girl would crush you like a bug. I don't care, okay? I don't care how dangerous it is or whether I'm a lowly, useless dog. Your hearing really is bad. I said a bug, not a dog, Edom says. Calling you a dog would be an insult. Noah practically spits. It's my jet and that's my offer. Take me with you or find another way home. Fine. Edom steps toward Noah and grabs him by the collar of his jacket. I'll knock him out and we'll take his jet anyway. Noah's eyes flash, but he doesn't back down, even with his feet dangling in the air. I'm almost impressed. It's easy to be brave when you're sure to win. It's harder when you're about to take an epic beating. I shake my head. No. Edom throws his hands in the air, dropping Noah in a heap in the process. Fine, call Alora. I'm sure she'll- We will take Noah's jet, and he will stay on board with his pilot when we land. Lark taps my elbow. Does anyone know we're coming? because they shoot down uninvited planes. Not yet. I call Inara. She picks up after only one ring. I hadn't heard from you since I sent that last video file, she says. I was worried. I'm fine, I say. In fact, I'm coming home. What? She asks. Now? Yes, I say. It's time. Tell Judica I'm not abdicating. And you can go ahead and tell her I'm not naming Edom as my consort either. I thought not, Inara says ruefully. It still might be your best idea. I've given it some thought and... I cut her off before Edom can hear confirmation that she's the one who sent the footage. Although he probably guessed. I'm only calling to ask you to pass a message along. Will you convey something to Judica for me? Something happened, Inara says. And you suspect me. I close my eyes. No. What happened? Are you all right? I clear my throat. There was an attack, but I'm fine, and I don't blame you. Judica has always been a wild card. I'm sorry, Inara says. And I'm so glad you're okay. I asked Inara to stay behind for me, but I haven't spent much time worried about her. Are you all right? Never mind that, Inara says. What can I do? Tell Judica I have the ring. 
She won't even consider shooting down the plane with the ring on board, Inara says. People don't give you enough credit. Think you can convince her? Is it true? Inara asks. Of course it is. Or at least I know where the ring is. Same thing, sort of. She'll push to fight you as soon as you land, Inara says. Be prepared, little one. I'll try, I say. Accept the world as it is, or do something to change it. I press end and go to collect my bags, but Edom's already carrying them up the stairs. No one speaks as we board. It's a nice plane, roomy even, at least until Frederick fills every seat. Wow, I say. This is a top-of-the-line jet, Noah. I'm blessed, that's for sure. Noah hands me a menu. Feel free to order anything that looks good. I've noticed you don't peck at things like a bird. I think I'm being insulted, I say. All this flirting is giving me a headache, Edom says. And we need to practice a few moves, and then you need a nap. I fill Noah in on the basics of what's going on while we wait for our sandwiches. I tell him a little more about my mom's death, how she changed the airship documents, and how my sister challenged me. I tell him I suspect my sister killed our mother, and that she's planning to bomb an open area to cement her rule. Wait. The color drains from Noah's face. Didn't you say the only open area is in China? He catches on too fast. Don't worry, I say. I'll stop her. He lifts both eyebrows. You also said she's a warrior and you are not. I open my mouth to argue, but he's right. I might lose. Actually, the odds are probably stacked against me no matter how you look at it. He should worry. Noah gulps. Do you know where in China? I wish I did. You're flying back to try and stop this attack, and you were going to leave me behind? But I didn't leave you, and if I lose, you can warn your family immediately. Warn them of what? He asks. Tell them to hide in a bomb shelter while everyone else they know dies? It's not ideal, I say. But at least you can tell them to evacuate from any metropolitan areas. His knee bounces up and down frenetically during takeoff. Once we're in the air, he stills entirely. Edom stands up and pulls me to my feet, too. He shows me the moves he mentioned earlier. Noah watches us stoically. Once I sit back down, he asks, Do you really have a chance of winning? Edom growls. Of course she's going to win, you idiot. What? Noah asks. I don't know anything about this. Last time we spoke, you were marrying Rocky here so he could fight for you. Change of plans. Edom says. But she's got this. Noah opens his mouth and Edom cuts him off. Unless you badger her with questions and she can't sleep. Noah's mouth clicks shut and he leans back stiffly in his chair. I breathe in and out a few times and close my eyes before my phone starts jangling in my pocket. Caller ID says it's a Laura. I'm surprised I've got reception, even with a satellite phone. I hit talk. Alora? I ask. Is everything okay? Chansey, can you hear me? Are you in the air? I am. Marcel needed to talk to you again. Okay. I wait. Marcel says, Chancery, I've been looking into your mom's murder ever since it happened. You already know my suspicions. Angel. But even if she administered the poison, she may just be the delivery person. My heart stutters. I think my twin killed our mom, but part of me still hopes she didn't. What have you learned? Marcel clears her throat. How much do you know about how our immune system works? Not a lot, I admit. In order to poison one of us, the poison must be very strong and fast-acting, or it must accumulate slowly with one type and punch through with another. If death is caused by accumulation, 
it requires consistent small doses to weaken the system first, then a significant dose of something strong to push our body over the edge. Accumulation is more commonly successful because usually the strong-acting poisons are detectable, either through use of dog testing or smell or texture. Okay, I say. The poison that killed your mother was exceedingly rare and difficult to detect, but it was neither strong nor fast-acting. That means she was dosed over an extended period of time and then hit right before her death with a separate toxin. Yes, we believe so. But the only poison registering in the examinations is the accumulation variety, a marine toxin we thought had long been extinct. I have no idea where it could have been procured, but Chancery? Yeah? Someone very old was involved. A chill runs down my spine. Someone old? Judica is many things, but she isn't old by any standard. It had to be administered over at least two months, which means substantial quantities over an extended period. And the poisoning began long before I reacted to the ring. That means it was someone who had access to her consistently, or possibly two different people. I close my eyes, unmoored, confused. It would have had other side effects, things you might have noticed, Marcel says. Such as, I ask. Most of the side effects might have been dismissed or hidden by Enora if she feared they were signs of aging. You're saying it would have caused fatigue or body aches, I ask. Sure, but some of the side effects would have been stranger. For example, it can cause contraceptives to fail. Which means the poisoner might have actually caused the pregnancy I thought prompted the assassination in the first place. Judica might have been telling the truth. Or she might have done it but recruited help. Wait, why did you say someone old was involved? The identity of that poison was difficult to figure out, but once we did, it's easier to track because it's nearly impossible to obtain, especially in the quantities used. You mentioned it was rare. I looked into where it might have come from, Marcel says. Any luck? I ask. We found someone who supplied about half of what would have been used. Whoa. That's good, right? Can they identify the purchaser? Maybe, Marcel says, if the supplier hadn't died before we could learn much. The only thing we forced from her was that the buyer wasn't young. They met for the first time more than 200 years ago. I want to put my hand through the wall of Noah's shiny jet. Did you learn anything useful at all? The ledger contained a single notation regarding the purchase. Does the word Nereus mean anything to you? No. Does it to you? No, Marcel says. But I looked it up. In Greek mythology, Nereus is the son of Gaia and the sea. He ruled the oceans of the earth. So the marine toxin is fitting, I say. That's everything my agents were able to pass along, Marcel says but I'll keep digging. Let me pass you back to Alora. Okay, I say. Thanks. Alora says, I'm sorry we don't know more yet. At the same time, Noah's flight attendant shows up with our sandwiches. Noah jokes with her while he takes them. Who are you with? Alora asks, her voice strained for some reason. I glance around the plane. Edom's listening and shrugs. Edom's here. Where did you procure the jet you're taking? She asks. I'm safe, I say. I'm with a friend from school. So you know. Alora makes a strangled sound. That's why you didn't take my plane. I assumed Inara sent one. My appetite evaporates. That would have taken too long. Alora cries softly into the phone, and the truth slaps me in the face. 
Alora's been my best friend other than Lark. I thought she loved me as much as mom. But she betrayed me to Judica. Why? I ask softly. I'm so sorry, Chancery, Alora says. I would never have done it if I had a choice. So much for her advice. Hang up on her, Edom says. Chancy, Alora pleads. Don't hang up. I need to explain. You weren't heir, so you don't understand. You're right, I say harshly. I wouldn't understand. I was never heir. I was always a nobody. No one ever cared what I thought or did. And apparently you still don't, even now. I hang up. Thirty-one. I don't mean to fall asleep, but I do. I wake up when the plane hits some serious turbulence. I sit up and look around. Bizarrely, Noah's awake and Edom's sleeping. He's reading on some kind of e-reader, tapping his bottom lip with his index finger. I've never been able to study him without him reacting. I like it. His hair is overdue for a cut, a little shaggy over the ears. He's heading into a world full of people who could snap him in half, and he doesn't even seem nervous. I trail downward with my eyes, from his intense face and striking jaw to the base of his neck, where his button-down shirt hangs open, showing dark, sun-kissed skin and a knotted black leather cord. Even lower, his shirt's untucked from his jeans. Designer, of course, and his legs are crossed at the ankle. As if he can feel my gaze on him, he looks up from his book and meets my eye. A half smile and a nod of his head, and I shift to the empty chair next to him. How long was I out? I ask. I'm not sure, Noah says. I just woke up myself. Did you sleep okay? Your jet is great. Thank you so much for loaning it to me at the last minute. I'm sorry you're missing school for this. By this, Noah says, you mean so you can fly to Hawaii and fight your sister to either change the course of the world or die trying? I guess that's what I mean. Why are you doing it? He asks. Doing what? Fighting her. Well, she's planning to kill everyone in your country that she can so she can subjugate the rest. Noah throws his hands up in the air. I get that she's crazy and therefore the enemy. What I mean is, why are you fighting her yourself? There have to be other options. Not that I wanted you to marry that guy. He jerks his thumb at Edom. But at least you thought he'd win for you. Sometimes it feels like my entire life has been on a collision course to this moment, I whisper. Does that sound crazy or unbearably arrogant? A little melodramatic, maybe, but that doesn't mean it's not also true, Noah says. But I still see other options. The world isn't as black and white as you seem to believe it is. I'm supposed to be the sister who sees in gray, but maybe I'm oversimplifying too. What do you mean? You could run with me. We can warn my family and they can evacuate. Could you live with all those people dying? I ask. Noah bites his lip. It wouldn't be our fault, but I guess not. Okay, I hate to say this, but why'd you change your mind about marrying the old man? I'd rather have you married to an ancient loser than dead. So now you're ready to support my idea, now that I've cast it off. What changed? I tap my fingers on the little divider between our seats. I don't know exactly. He did something, Noah whispers in Mandarin. His eyes meet mine, and for a moment, it's like he can see straight into my soul, reading all my secrets. I shiver and reply in Mandarin. I have no idea who can speak it, but I know that every passenger on this jet speaks English. No, he didn't. He's great. The corners of Noah's mouth turn up. Something made you doubt him. What was it? You don't have to tell me. 
but I warn you, I'm a great judge of character, so I'm not surprised. I lean my head back against the seat. I found out that he's been in contact with his sister. Noah stares at me blankly. She's the leader of a rival family. Whoa, Noah says. Treason? I bob my head reluctantly. That is worse than I was expecting by, like, a factor of ten. Yeah, it's kind of a mess. Lark and Edom are the two people I probably trust most, and both of them are technically guilty of treason. The thing is, Evians are complicated. I'll just say, I understand why he did what he did. If I'd been in his shoes, I might have done the same thing. Family gets fractured sometimes because of the nature of who we are and what's expected. It's one of the things I want to work to repair if I... If you survive. Noah's expression is grim. I bop my head. How good is she? Do you have a chance? Noah balls his hands into fists. That came out wrong. I appreciate that you ask real questions, never pulling punches. Thanks, I guess, Noah says. I'm just struggling here, thinking you're rolling the dice and hoping you can defeat her. He exhales heavily. Killing your twin sister seems so drastic, and maybe you aren't seeing it because you feel backed into a corner. I'm good at helping people figure out how to tunnel their way out. If I were supposed to kill one of my siblings, I'd be tunneling as fast as I could the other direction. I've done that for 17 years. The harder I tunnel, the faster she pursues. You told me at the track meet that people aren't all victims or Vikings. And that may be true for humans, but for Evians? I shake my head. Judica has terrorized me my entire life, and I'm done taking it. It's time I try to stop her for once. And if I can eliminate the threat she poses to the world, then I'll be doing Alameca a huge favor. I hope. You don't think she's the strongest one anymore? She is strong, I say. But Edom can beat her, so she's not bulletproof. I cough. Well, bullets wouldn't kill her, but you get my point. She isn't invulnerable. But you don't trust him anymore, so you're stuck taking the risk yourself. I sigh heavily. It's not that I don't trust him, so much as that I need to do this myself. I've tunneled away from her for so long, Noah. At some point, I have to stand up and fight back. I guess now is my moment. Noah takes my hand in his. I don't know her, but I've watched you and you're strong. Maybe the strongest person I've ever met. And you're introspective. You don't just press your will on people. You listen, you think, and then you act. That's the right order. And you'll figure out the correct move for you and your family when it's time. I believe that all the way down to my deficient, unworthy human bones. His fingers against mine feel too good. I want to sink into him and let the rest of the world disappear, which means it's time to let go of his hand. And right now, I should eat. I'm starving. Even high-end sports cars need fuel. Message received. Noah walks to the front of the jet and clears his throat. Excuse me. A tall woman with black hair and dark eyes appears in the doorway. Yes, sir? I was wondering what time it is, he asks. New York time or Hawaii, she asks. New York. It's 9 a.m. in New York, she says. Oh, no. I slept for almost eight hours, and we land in less than an hour. Would you like breakfast? She asks Noah. Please. I think about Edom and Lark, both of whom will be as hungry as me. Can you make enough for eight people and bring it for me and Noah and those two? I point at Lark and Edom, who are both lifting their heads probably due to the sound of my voice. And I'm guessing the others on the plane will be wanting food too. Maybe just bring out everything you have in the back. We will replenish your stores once we land. Her eyes widen. 
but to her credit, she nods and ducks back into her area. I walk back to my seat and sit down, rolling my head one way and then the other. We may not need to stretch, but it feels good sometimes. Edom wakes up next to me, the muscles of his arms rippling as he shifts and then straightens. Are you nervous? Petrified, I say, and regretting every second of the time I had that I didn't spend training. I'm an idiot. Edom puts a hand on my arm. A lot of your preparation took place here, Edom says softly, tapping my forehead with his index finger in an eerie echo of Alora. Thanks, I say. Thanks for what? Noah yawns. Not you, idiot, I say. I was thanking Edom. Well, you ought to thank me for letting you guys just snore away. A lesser guy probably would have poked you. I don't snore, I say. How do you know? Noah smiles and raises both eyebrows. By definition, you can't be sure. She doesn't snore, Edom says. No, Evian does. Wait, since you snore, dear Coach Renfro, does that mean you're partially human like me? Noah smirks. Or maybe extreme age brings that out in everyone, Evian or not. Stop it, I say. They both sober immediately. I must be in bad shape, I say, for you to back down so fast. I couldn't believe I sunk to his level, Edom says. Noah's flight attendant shows up with an enormous tray of pastries and another tray stacked up with bagels and cream cheese. Several other women pass out similar piles of food to the guards. Noah must be even hungrier than me because he's the first one to take a bite. I slather a cinnamon raisin bagel with cream cheese and bite down. Hey, I say to Edom, you aren't tasting this stuff first. It's Noah's people preparing it, he says. And he's eating it with us, and he's human, which makes him the perfect tester. That's true. I take a bite, pause for a moment, and then grab my throat and pretend to choke. Oh, please, Edom says. You'd have to do better than that to fool me. A thud behind us draws our attention. Noah's convulsing on the ground. His face is red and he isn't breathing. Drool covers the bottom part of his face. Oh no! I drop to the floor and open his mouth wider to check his airway, ignoring the fact that he's biting down on my fingers. It's clear, but he's still convulsing. Could it be poison? It would affect him first. Edom kneels down, trying to hold Noah's flailing body still. If Edom's worried, this is a real problem. Go call for help and ask them for a syringe, I say. An Evian blood transfusion might help. Lark hops to her feet and rushes toward the front of the plane. I lean over Noah again and check his eyes. But then the shaking stops as suddenly as it began and his eyes open. He reaches up, grabs my head, and tries to pull me down for a kiss. I slap him away. How was that? Convincing enough for you, oh great Evian overlord? He looks pointedly at Edom. The laugh starts in my belly and fills my entire frame. Oh man, I say around peals of laughter. He really got you, and right after you said I'd have to do better. A human! Edom rolls his eyes, but even he looks moderately amused. I ought to strangle you, just so I have a baseline for how it looks. Noah smiles. Princess needed to think about something other than her upcoming fight. Edom quirks one eyebrow. Princess? My nickname for her turned out to be accurate. I find that ironic. Edom coughs. Let me get this straight. Your plan was to convince someone whose mother died from poison a few days ago that you'd been poisoned? As a joke? I sit back on my heels. I hadn't thought of it that way. Maybe because I found mom after it was already too late. I wish I'd been there with her when she collapsed so I could have tried to do something. Or I could have heard her last words at least. I'm an idiot, Noah says. I'm so sorry. I shrug. 
I'm surprisingly not upset about his prank. He didn't know, and I gave him the idea, what with mocking Edom about how he always worries about testing my food. It's okay. You didn't mean any harm. I do want to be up and moving, though. Edom, you down for a little warm-up before we land? Sure, he says, as long as we stick to hand-to-hand. -hand. Probably shouldn't destroy Noah's jet, at least not while we're flying in it. Noah shrugs. Like my yacht, it's the worst one my family owns. Don't stress. Don't stress. I think about Noah's admonition and realize it's an impossible suggestion. Judica's planning to kill me and cement her rule by taking over China. It will shift the entire balance of power in the families. And if they're scared enough, they might go down like dominoes. She might succeed in taking over the other families. But does it count as uniting them if she does it through brute force? It's not like any of the deep-seated disagreements, jealousies, or bad blood will be settled. Edom interrupts my reflection by launching a series of strikes. I counter each one almost without thinking, which leaves me plenty of bandwidth to contemplate Judica's plans. The only way to truly unite people is to bring them together, not to shove them down into a hole. The only way I can prevent Judica from subjugating the entire world is to defeat her myself. Surely that will spook the other families enough that they'll back off while I get Alameca whipped into supporting me. But how can I do that? Edom speeds up, but I'm so busy thinking that I don't worry about it. I merely counter his moves. Block, deflect, block, strike. It's almost easier to fight when I'm not focusing on it. We move up and down the aisle slowly, darting between rows of startled guards now and then. I choke out a laugh when Arlington trips Edom and throws me a thumbs up. It's too bad I won't have anyone handy to trip Judica. Alora said the key to melodics lies in knowing my enemy. Even if I can't trust Alora, I think her advice was sound. So what do I know about Judica? Her primary motivating force is ambition, or maybe anger. She's furious I stole mom's time and love, and maybe impatient with how long she's having to wait to lead Alameca. I was positive she killed mom, but now I'm not quite as sure. And if she didn't, who did? And did Sotiris existence precipitate Judica poisoning her? Or was the poison the reason mom became pregnant in the first place? And for that matter, who was the father? How has this question not occurred to me before now? I spent nearly every minute with mom, and I never saw her express an interest in anyone. Why would she hide a relationship from me? And who could he be? Surely he knew about her pregnancy, right? Maybe Judica tired of waiting for mom to age and decided to poison her. She might not have gone through with it, but she wanted to feel like she was in control. She might have unwittingly caused Sotiris, and when mom told her the truth, it prompted Judica to finish things. Or perhaps it was my reaction to the ring that set her over the edge, or some combination of the two. Either way, Judica would have needed help from someone older to pull it off. Someone knowledgeable with poison to locate the toxin. Of course, she has an entire guard of people who could help her, and who are tasked to serve her. Presumably, she trusts at least a few of them. Edom sweeps my legs out from under me, and my back whams against the floor, knocking the air from my lungs. I look up into Edom's wide eyes. What was that for? I ask. I said warm up, not take down. He offers me a hand. I told you we're preparing to land, but you weren't listening. Duh. Trapped up here, I tap my forehead. Sorry about that. He and I scramble back to our seats and buckle up. I hear the landing gear deploying, and I take one deep breath. Edom opens his mouth, and I pray he's not about to try and convince me to make him my consort again. I feel his gaze on me and slowly turn to meet his eyes. They burn into mine, 
So beautiful, so strong, so sure. How could I have doubted he supports me? If he asks to be my consort right now, maybe I should say yes. His voice is low, steady, and confident. You are ready. You can do this. In some ways, it's harder that he didn't offer. Am I being an idiot? I feel like an idiot, flipping and flopping and emotional. I close my eyes and lean against my seat. I thought I was nervous before, but as the plane lands, my knee begins to bounce. Edom covers it with his large hand. I don't feel well, I say. I'm not sure what's wrong. Edom unbuckles and wraps an arm around me. The humans call this feeling sick. You've never felt it before, but I've seen that look on a lot of their faces. I'm dizzy and lightheaded. My stomach aches and I'm shaky. You're telling me humans feel this way frequently? Noah barks out a laugh from up ahead, his head craned around so he can see me. Is anyone on this plane wearing their seatbelt? That's pretty much human 101. I'm truly sorry to hear that. How awful. Noah rolls his eyes and turns back around. The plane lands safely on our family's landing strip, and the doors open. Frederick insists on the majority of my guards deplaning first, with Noah, Lark, and me leaving just in front of Edom and himself. As I walk down the stairs to the ground, rows and rows of guards stand at attention in the pre-dawn light. An honor guard always welcomed my mom and me home, so it feels right. Except mom's not here. The moment my feet touch the pavement, Judica shouts, Now! That's when I realize that, uniforms notwithstanding, all of the guards present were part of Judica's private guard when I left. The guards all pull their guns. Edom pulls a gun too, and my crew springs into action. Even Noah sinks on his feet, disarming the guard nearest him and pointing the weapon at the now unarmed and shocked guard's head. It's still not enough, not by a long shot. Wait, I say. There's no way we can survive this many bullets. They'd take us down while we tried to heal the damage. I don't even want to think about what would happen to Lark and Noah. Didn't Inara tell you? I ask. If you shoot me, you'll never get the ring. Oh, I think we're capable of searching through your corpses until we find it. Judica's mouth turns up in the corner. If I had it on me, that would be true enough, I say. But I'm guessing you didn't find it in my absence, so I doubt you'll figure it out anytime soon. You hid it here? Judica's eyes widen. If you kill me, the location is gone. Judica's face shows not a twinge of emotion. Why should I believe that? Where's Inara? I ask. Shouldn't she be here with you, giving the orders to the guards while I squirm like a fish on a hook? Is that what she'd do? Judica asks. Order your execution? I think she'd insist you at least follow through on your bargain and fight me, I say. But I wouldn't know. She stayed with you. Only to report back to you, Judica practically snarls. She turns around and barks a command over her shoulder. Bring in Nara. Two guards duck out and emerge less than a minute later, one holding each arm as a struggling Inara emerges. A quick glance shows several missing fingers in varying stages of regrowth. Judica obviously did not take the news of my return well. I feel guilty for doubting her now. I knew you left her as your little spy, Judica says, but I didn't think she'd be able to send you anything helpful. You're wrong, I say. She's a good sister to both of us, and she was trying to find a resolution that would have satisfied mom. Judica's laugh chills me to the bone. We shared a womb, you and I. You're my only true sister, but you're a fool if you think we'll ever share anything again. I don't compromise. Are you really so afraid of me that you're planning to gun me down on a runway? 
Judica's eyes flash. I'm not scared of you, but I won't let your consort kill me either. I challenged you and you didn't have a consort then. I wouldn't have agreed to a delay if I knew it would shift the stakes. You've been misinformed. I haven't named a consort, I say, and I won't be doing it anytime soon. If you really are brave enough to fight me, I'll promise to give you the ring if I lose. Judica sets her jaw. If you lose, you're dead. Corpses can't keep promises. I'll leave you a letter that tells you its location. Why am I not surprised to learn you lied the night mother died? I shake my head. I didn't know then. Mom sent me a message at Alora's on the day of her death that disclosed the truth. I watch her to see whether she knows what I'm really saying, that I know about Sotiris. Her face doesn't even twitch. Which means you may not even know where it is. You haven't verified that information. Frederick catches my eye and inclines his head almost imperceptibly. I know where it is. Mother sent you the location. Judica's voice is flat. Mom trusted me, I say. You're implying she didn't trust me. No one trusts you, I say. This is a surprise to you? She scowls. I could have you executed for treason in my absence, you know. I signal Frederick, and another line of guards run out and surround Judica's. Or had you forgotten that I'm the real empress? Maybe that's your excuse for ordering a hit on me, too. I didn't try to assassinate you, Judica says. You didn't send the recluse to kill me? Could Alora have hired them to shove suspicion onto Judica? My heart cracks, but I can't spiral, not now. Judica glares at me. Inara promised she had a formal request for an inquest regarding mother's death with the five prepared that would be filed if you were assassinated. I'm not afraid of them, but I don't welcome that kind of interference either. I didn't raise a finger against you. I can't decide if I'm more upset about Alora's incompetent attack or relieved that at least she didn't betray me to Judica. I know you're planning a missile launch against China. You will promise not to give that order, whether I win or lose. Judica smiles. Why would I agree to any requests? My heart constricts. I want Judica brought to justice if I die trying to defeat her. But I care more about the people who are still alive. I'm sorry, Mom. It's the only way I can think to guarantee that my people survive and Judica doesn't bomb China. If you agree to my terms, Inara will sign away her right to request an inquest as your heir. But only if you swear not to order a missile launch on China and you promise not to kill or punish Edom, Lark, Inara, or any of my other supporters if you defeat me, including Alora. Inara tries to protest but a guard smashes her in the face, breaking her nose. It's okay, I tell her. I'm more worried about keeping everyone safe than pursuing justice if I die. Judica smiles. I will agree not to order a missile launch on China after our duel. That was almost too easy. I want it in writing, and what about my supporters? She laughs but it's an ugly laugh. You're bargaining for their lives when you die? She looks around the landing strip. This is your empress. She's so sure she won't win that she's negotiating your release when she fails. Do you agree? I ask her. Her eyes are still laughing, but I refuse to be embarrassed for planning for my loved ones, including those who hurt me. Finally, she says, I agree, although I don't make any promises regarding exile. She glances behind me at Lark, especially for traitorous mutts who aren't even supposed to be alive. Done, I say. I need proof that you've located the ring before the fight, she says. 
Lorena can help with that. And I don't want you wearing it during the duel. Edom's eyes widen, but Inara meets my gaze steadily. We both know why Judica doesn't want me wearing it, and I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to be torched during a fight either. Now that I'm here, facing Judica down, I want to cry. Poor mom. Her greatest fear realized. Her daughters fighting one another to the death. Agreed. Judica sighs heavily, almost like she's dreading this as much as me. Well, then, blood of my blood, shall we fight? Blood of my blood? Judica's always been ridiculously melodramatic. Let's go. When we reach the main hallway, a familiar barking draws my attention. Duchess flies down the hall like an arrow. Mom's dog was immaculately trained. She didn't bark, she didn't jump up on anyone, and she waited to come until she was called. This duchess has lost quite a bit of weight, and she leaps up once she reaches me, placing a paw on both of my shoulders and nearly bowling me over. Edom draws his sword. I wave him off and crouch down to eye level. Duchess licks my face, and when I start to cry, she licks my tears away. I know. I whisper into her ruff. I'm hurting too. Finally, I stand up and give her one more pat. The guards who supported me upon my landing have joined my small force. I'm shocked by how many came to my defense. I look for Inara and find her, tripping along behind the two guards who brought her here. Wait, I yell. Release Inara. Feeling guilty? Judica asks. I shake my head. I didn't do that. You did. But she's our sister, and she deserves to walk on her own. Judica snorts. You're exhausting. She turns to her guards. Take her to a holding cell below, pending the resolution of our disagreement. I consider arguing, but I've exhausted my leverage. At least I've secured Judica's promise that she won't harm anyone if I lose. Draw up the papers and send them to my room. Once they've been signed and witnessed, I'm ready to fight. Delightful, Judica says. Bring the ring or all your extra terms are off. Frederick and Arlington lead the way, and my procession passes the training room and continues on to the throne room. The arena is already set up inside, the raised dais prepared and illuminated with the barriers erected the majesty of mom's throne rising behind it. People are already assembled in rows to watch. I could have used the support of some of them back on the airstrip. Balthazar sits on the front row, and I wonder how he justified sitting over here during my plane's landing. Maybe they didn't know Judica planned to eliminate the need for this challenge. Or maybe they simply didn't have the gumption to object. I worry for my people. How could Balthazar choose between us? He trained Judica for years, but he's known, and I believe loved, both of us. If he's torn, how could any of my people not be confused and hurting? Judica tosses me a white training uniform embroidered with our family sigil. A circle of thorny vines surrounding the sun signifies light in the face of adversity. Judica walks toward her room, ostensibly to change, and I head toward mine, too. I sure hope I'm right about Mom's ring. Just before her party, I saw Mom leaving my room. She left the gown on my bed, but she could have had a servant do that. She almost never went into my room without me. And when I changed into that gown... The melodics training flute case I used as a young child but haven't touched in over a decade fell off my bed. It can't be a coincidence, right? Noah, Edom, and Lark follow me to the door, but I ask them to wait outside. As soon as the door closes behind them, I race to my closet. It's been ransacked, so I dig through pile after pile without luck. At the very bottom of my closet, underneath a pile of clothing. 
there's a long, heavy object wrapped in brown paper. I slide it out, curious. It's clearly not the flute case or the ring, but what is it? I open the paper to reveal a sword in a black scabbard. I slide it out and admire the clean, smooth hilt, the sheen carrying all the way to the end. I check the balance, and it's as perfect as I expected. A few words are scrawled on the brown paper I discarded. I recognize the blade. It's in Nara's. Until you have your own. A tear springs to my eye. She must have hidden this when she realized Judica wouldn't allow her the freedom to support me. But if I use it, my twin will know with certainty that Inara stayed to help defend me and my position. This blade would certainly help me win. And ironically, if I lose, it would seal my older sister's fate. I could never do that to her. I wrap the blade back up and place it where I found it, minus the part of the paper with the message scrawled on it, which I shred into tiny pieces and flush. After I resume my search, it takes a moment, but I find it under a disheveled box of papers. A small black case, tattered and worn. I carry it over to my desk and set it down. I open it, and as I expect, the only thing in the case is a wooden flute. I pull a knife from my bedside table and slice the side of the case, peeling away the worn black velvet. It resists more than it should for such an old case because it was re-glued last week. I pull and tug and peel, and it finally separates. I remove the wooden shell from the top of the inside of the case, and then I can see it, stuffed on all sides with fiber fill so it won't rattle around in the frame. Mom's steridium ring. The cause of this whole nightmare. Instead of putting it on my finger, I set it on my desk and change into the white tank top with the sigil and matching fitted pants. A knock at my door startles me, and I toss a throw blanket over the ring. Enter, I say. Edom opens the door, his eyes darting around the room. Lorena is here with the paperwork you requested. I sigh and wave them inside. Edom insists on standing next to her, as though Lorena might suddenly attack me instead of boring me to death with paperwork. Here's what I want to know, I say. Does this give the Five a mandate to step in if Judica violates these promises? Lorena nods. They'd have the excuse they need to consolidate their forces and move against your sister if she doesn't honor them. Good enough. I sign the paperwork and stand up. It's the best I can do. I'm ready. Not quite. Lorena says. Excuse me? Edom asks. Lorena lifts the lid on a box underneath the paperwork. It's solid glass, hollowed out in the center. I need the ring. It will sit on a platform in front of the dais. Winner takes it. That's your consideration for this contract. I shake my head. I'll place it in the box in the ballroom, in front of Judica. Lorena shrugs, gathers her things, and leaves. Edom takes my hand. Are you ready? Accept the world as it is, I say. Or do something to change it. He takes my hands in his and squeezes them. I look at Noah and he smiles at me. No frowns and fear from me. You'll make the right choice when it's time. I have faith in you. Lark doesn't say anything, but she pulls me close for a long hug. When she finally releases me, her eyes swim with unshed tears. It's nice to see that a few people, at least, have faith in me. I walk toward the duel, trailed by my strongest supporters. When I reach the room, I hold Mom's ring over my head. I hold Enora Isadora Alameca's ring, the largest shard from Eve's Staridium. I will leave it here to await the winner of this duel. By rights, the current empress should wear the ring for the duel. But if it makes Judica nervous, well, I can't fault her. 
Besides, this isn't about a rock, and it never should have been. Mom made a mistake there. Judica stands in the center of the arena. Well met, sister. Select our method. I can't stomach a hand-to-hand -hand battle to the death, so I named the only viable alternative. Blades. Judica smiles. Mom gave Judica her own blade on her 10th birthday, and she had another made for her when she turned 16. I don't own one myself, and I couldn't bring myself to implicate Inara, which means I'll have to use one of the unclaimed practice blades. I look at the rack and trail my fingers down the length of the hilts. They vary in length, weight, and style. Curved blades, double-edged, blunt-tipped, decorative, simple. I walk toward the far end, where the small, light blades rest. One catches my eye. It's mid-length, thin, double-edged. It's simple, but gilded Hebrew letters are worked down the length of the blade, and tiny black stone chips run down the center line. The letters in the blade almost glow. Failure is a choice, they say. A motto I know well. Mom's personal motto. I lift the blade and shift it from one hand to the other. I turn to face Judica, but before I can step into the arena, Balthazar touches my arm. Do you know that sword? I shake my head. It was your mother's wedding gift from my brother. Of course. It would have been her motto even then. It seems fitting to slay Mom's murderer with her own blade like an act of vengeance from beyond the grave. I ascend the steps to the arena, walk inside, and pull the half wall closed. Judica salutes with her much larger, much nastier sword. It's a good day to die. Thirty-two. Accept the world as it is, Judica says. Or have the courage to change it, I say. Marx, Judica calls out. The arena teems with Alameca Evians, men, women, and children. They murmur softly, shift from foot to foot, and glance flightily from Judica to me and back again. Many of the young ones have never witnessed a royal duel but if this goes badly, there might be more as soon as this ends. The last royal challenge was when Melina fought Mom. Now, not even 18 years later, the cause of that duel brings it full circle. Maybe Melina was right. Mom should have killed me. I breathe in through my nose, close my eyes, and picture my mom. She'd be devastated to see her daughters killing one another, but not surprised. The first clap rises from all the Evians gathered around me like the crack of a whip. Humans are always clapping, but Evians only clap en masse for two things. Beginning a duel and acknowledging a new monarch. I open my eyes on the second clap and exhale through my mouth on the third. A millisecond after the third clap, Judica's sword flies toward my neck. I drop below her swing at the last second and slash at her legs with mine. My sword arcs faster than any I've ever used, as if it were made for me. I'm surprised when I nick her leg. Judica gasps, probably more from shock than pain, and leaps back nimbly. She circles me in the arena, buying time to heal her wound. I let her, because I'm not sure how to attack yet. I should be hearing her melodic line, but I'm not. My mind is blank. I cycle through the videos Inara sent and close my mind to doubt, fear, and hate. I open it to the music around me. The slow beating of hundreds of hearts, the quick breathing, the shuffling of feet and the shifting of arms and hands. I tune into my twin, narrowing my focus to her breath, sucked in and released. 
I react to her movements reflexively, ducking and deflecting her parries, jabbing back to watch how she responds. And I finally hear it, her melodic line. Faint, but there. Clear, dire, straightforward in life, sideways in battle. I think back to our childhood. She didn't physically attack me when we were nine, but she tried to poison me. She acts forthright and then comes at you sideways when she means harm, almost as if inflicting harm shames her. But she baked the poisoned cookies herself. I should watch for attacks that come from her directly, but in unexpected ways. If I'd had the thought a second later, I'd be dead. I named blades, but I didn't specify the number. I assumed we were limited to one, or I would have chosen a short sword as well. But I never stated the limitation. She pulls a short sword from behind her back and throws it at me. No wonder she was circling, biding her time. She didn't need me close. She just needed to distract me. I drop to the mat just in time, and my hand snaps out as the short sword flies over my head, my fingers closing over its hilt. It's much lighter than my blade, and now I have the two I wanted. She couldn't have known that I fight better with two weapons because I didn't know myself until a few days ago. Mom's presence surrounds me like a balm. Like even now, even here, she's guiding things. Judica scowls but recovers quickly. She leaps across the entire arena and lands inside my guard, her broadsword slicing downward like a hammer to an anvil. I twist left, under her sword arm, and slam the hilt of my mom's blade into her elbow. I smile when I hear the crunch this time, until Judica's blade slices down into my foot, pinning me to the mat, just like she speared my hand with that fork. It feels like that interrupted breakfast on the day the Staridium responded to me took place a lifetime ago. Everything has shifted since then. And I'm different, too. This time, I'm not frozen by shock or fear or righteous indignation. I pull backward with all my strength, forcing the blade through the bones, tendons, ligaments, and muscles of my foot. Blood sprays the mat and the audience beyond, and I collapse to my knees as the pain rips through me. Judica thinks she has won. She tosses her sword into her other hand, her lip curling into a grin, sure that I can't move well until I heal. I've never fought through the pain, because I never understood it. She was right. But she changed all that when she killed our mother. This time, after years of giving ground, after years of playing defense, I'm done. I won't defend anymore. I will attack. When she comes for me, I fall back like she expects. But then I roll and come up with both blades out. I cross swipe with them, and my mother's blade catches Judica's shoulder. Her eyes widen, and her face flushes, and she rains blows down on me. But I leap to my functioning feet and meet her blows in a staccato rhythm. For the first time, I hear my own melodic line, and I revel in it. When Judica slices at me, I block and launch an attack of my own. I feel her next move and wrap my own around it, dancing with her in a complex and undescribably beautiful interchange. We trade blows for several minutes, but I'm not gaining. She stays a few milliseconds ahead of me, which means I'm still missing something. But what? Judica's angry, ambitious, and what else? Could the thing I'm missing be guilt? Do you regret it? I block her advance with the short sword and jab at her left knee with mom's. She frowns at me. Do I regret what? Killing mom. Judica's eyes flash and the intensity of her strikes deepens. I'm missing something, something big. She slices my left arm and then my right leg. So you don't. Judica roars. I didn't kill her. You're lying. I practically spit the words. You must be. 
Judica slams her sword against Mom's, and the clang reverberates through my right arm. How can you be so sure? Because Mom told me everything in her letter. What does that even mean? Judica pulls back and yanks a dagger from a slit in her sliced pants. She must have worn a sigh sheath. Now we're both armed with two blades, except Judica holds her dagger in her right hand, and I use my short sword in my left. It's not like you need to gloat about how much more she loved you. I know already. Everyone knows. Something about this moment seems surreal, as though I'm momentarily looking down on us from above. Mirror opposites, locked in combat against our will. We look the same, but we're different in every important way. How could she kill our mom? How could she kill our little sister in utero? I'm not gloating, Judica. It broke my heart, I say. We lost the same person, she says, but you're such a martyr about it. Judica lands a glancing blow on my shoulder. I jump backward. I actually cared about her, even though I didn't know her. She might have fixed things between us, you know. What are you rambling about? Judica straightens, pausing her attack momentarily. Our sister, I say. Mom was pregnant, and you killed her for it. Judica's face blanks, and her hand loosens on the hilt of her sword. Even the tip of her dagger dips downward. She didn't know. She stumbles backward a step and opens a window. I could incapacitate her now, maybe even kill her. But I can't do it, not like this, not using Sotiris' existence as a weapon. My voice is shrill and cold when I say, you poisoned her when you found out. Judica doesn't deny it. She's too dazed to say anything at all. And I'm horribly worried it's because she wasn't lying. My heart aches at the thought. But what if she didn't do it? Could Judica be hurting as badly as me? Or even worse, since Inara, Alora, and Edom all sided with me. For the first time, her bone-crushing despair, the soul-wounding sorrow that weighs her down becomes clear to me. In Judica's mind, Mom never loved her. She never thought I loved her either, and then Edom dumped her. Finally, the one thing she had, Mom's throne, was pulled out from under her feet when I reacted to a lump of black rock. Then I throw Mom's pregnancy at her like a bomb. Mom told me, not her. Mom loved me, not her. Mom chose me, not her. Alora chose me. Edom chose me. Everyone chooses me. I could hear parts of her melodic line, but I've been missing the most basic notes. The anger, the frustration, and the jealousy form a descant that rises above and surrounds a framework of aching, bone-crushing desperation. Judica's not the dragon I always took her for. No, she's a wounded animal, lashing out at her attackers. She's taking on the entire world alone and screaming her rage in its face. Her song echoes all around me as we dance. Cross, parry, strike. I back in a circle while she rains blows on me, right and left. Finally, she falls into a very predictable pattern. Strike, hold, strike, hold. I can almost hear my mother whistling with her little wooden flute. A simple run, C minor to an F minor triad. My mother's phantom playing fills my ears. Instead of merely defending with my left arm, I begin to use it on offense, an intervallic relation to replace lone notes. Judica falters. She doesn't understand why or how I leveled up. She steps back, resheathes her dagger, and grips her sword with both hands. She swings at me again, then faints and swings from the other direction at light speed. A key change. I catch her sword with both of mine, 
crossing my arms and throwing hers back in her face. She stumbles back and I'm on her, slashing with the short sword and striking with my mother's sword intermittently. She falls back, blocking and turning to evade my attack. I press my advantage. Ambient sounds drop away, and only our melodic lines, accompanied by mom's flute, every strike a note, every block and spin a run, envelop us. My opening appears when Judica's pants catch on an outcropping of the arena I backed her into, slowing her slightly. I jab her with her own short sword, and it slides into her ribs, impaling her a hair below her heart. One upward thrust, and she'll have catastrophic damage to repair. The kind of damage that would incapacitate her for a kill shot. And she knows exactly what I've done. Her eyes flash, not with anger, but with resolution. Finish it, then. A flick of my wrist and I'll slice her heart in two. She'll finally feel the way she made me feel every day, every week, every year of our lives. The way she rent my heart when she killed Pebbles while intending to murder me. The way I felt when she stabbed me with a fork and laughed. The way I felt when she taunted and mocked me, belittling me and attacking me over everything that made me different. I should end this. I should spare everyone in China and everyone else she will threaten if she continues in her destructive, selfish, ferocious path. But if she didn't kill our mother, maybe it's not too late for her. I can't undo death. Nothing has become more clear to me since mom died. A scarlet tear wells in her left eye. Stop prolonging this and do it! Is she begging me to end her suffering the way I'd put down a wounded horse? Has she been in unbearable pain this whole time? Was she lashing out because she can't heal the injuries she has sustained? I stare into her deep blue eyes. Eyes that remind me so much of our mother. My eyes are the same, but seeing them staring at me from Judica's face, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Even if she killed mom, even if she's the devil everyone sees, I can't kill my own twin. Alora and Edom and Inara all explained why she must die. Even Noah, a human, understands why I should end her. I wonder how many people explained to my mother why I had to die. How many people did she ignore when she spared me? How much did that decision cost? When will the payment for her mistake end? If I don't kill Judica, the five will see me as easy prey. They'll attack Alameca. Judica will remain a threat, maybe forever. And most of all, I know Judica wouldn't hesitate to kill me if our situations were reversed. I still can't do it. I know me, and my strength is not in death or destruction. My power does not derive from hate. I want to build and heal. I want to right the wrongs of the world, not create more injustice and more devastation. Judica sees my weakness for what it is. Even with a sword rammed in her own chest, she brings all her strength to bear and swings her sword around and down on mine, chopping the short sword in two. The blow tears her chest open in the process. She reaches down and drags the end of the blade from her body, slicing her palms, but freeing her chest to heal. Her maniacal expression causes me to slide backward, putting some space between us. I throw the hilt of the short sword to the edge of the ring and bring mother's sword up and around to protect me. Before Judica can heal her hands and grab her sword, I press the razor-sharp edge against her throat. I don't want to kill you, I say. No, you can't kill me. You're too soft. The effort of speaking makes her cough, 
and she sprays blood all over my shirt. I shove mom's blade forward, slicing into her neck. Yield, never, she says. I won't, I can't yield. I was born to rule. You've chosen badly, Judica. She snarls. What do you know about my choices? You don't know me at all. I clench my hand on the hilt, trying to convince her that I can do it. I need her to seed the loss. It won't keep her from challenging me again tomorrow, but at least for today, she must back down. I don't realize how long I've delayed until I see skin spread across her exposed abdomen. When I look back up at her face, she smiles again, but there's no joy in it. She leaps backwards and throws her feet up at the same time, knocking the hilt of mom's old blade from my hand. She catches the end of it, blood spraying outward. She slams it down behind her, and it sinks several inches into the wooden floor of the room below, outside of the raised arena, out of bounds. Judica tosses her head at me and grins bitterly as she stands. You can't do what needs to be done, she says. You never could. Mother saw it and she protected you from me, but she's not here anymore. You can't even keep hold of your sword. She looks pleased, and she should. She's facing me, armed, while I have nothing. The next moment is a blur of pain and destruction, as I block with my forearms and shins and heal the damage as quickly as I can. I listen for her melodic line, but hear nothing. I'm scrambling, desperate to locate some kind of pattern, but I'm too busy deflecting death blows into maiming ones. She comes after me like a dervish, her sword flashing, raining jabs and slices down on me with murderous glee. Judica's toying with me like a lynx with a wounded robin. You've improved, Chancery, Judica pauses. You heal much faster, maybe faster than me. I didn't understand pain before. Judica barks a laugh. You think you do now? We've both suffered in the past week. Judica lost her mother, only to discover that mom had betrayed her, assigning her birthright to another. Then she challenged me and spent a week assuming I'd return with her old boyfriend to kill her. At every turn, Judica has been beaten, abused, and rejected. She must be strong, because otherwise she is nothing. Now that I see her for who she is, I'm overwhelmed by her beauty. I would have curled up and died in her place. The weight of her despair would have leveled me. How might we have changed if she had a chance to be anything but the bad guy? How have our circumstances carved us into the mirror opposites we have become? If I want to heal Alameca, I need to start at home. Judica redoubles her efforts, tearing into me like a ravaging beast, lashing out at me as retribution for all the pain she's in. Her next strike slices through skin and sinew and shatters my collarbone. A kick spins me to the right, and when I try to correct my position, she brings my head down against a knee strike. But all of this was never about rage or anger. It was always about a deep and abiding pain, an unfathomable suffering. In the very nanosecond, she launches her final strike at me, her enormous broadsword arcing toward my unmoving neck. I drop insanely fast to the mat. My hands come together and slam into the bottom of her fingers where they clasp the hilt of her sword, knocking it free. I slap it with my full force and send it flying from the arena. It lodges in a sidewall, inches away from a child's shocked face. The next few moments are a series of strikes, kicks, and punches. I'm almost an observer, my body moving easily, quickly, methodically. Judica rushes to catch me again and regain her position, because she doesn't comprehend what has happened. I've finally found peace. I can't let her die without ever knowing joy or experiencing love. I'll set things right. 
I pull her up by her hair and punch her square in the face, knocking her back and breaking her nose. I leap from the arena and grab Mom's sword. I jump back in just as Judica regains her feet. Mom always loved you, I say, just as much as she loved me. A new baby would not have changed how she felt about us. It would not have destroyed you. That baby would have set both of us free. Judica's lips draw back. You don't know anything. Mom loved you to the end, and so do I, I say. That's why I will not kill you today. I don't care whether you yield. Today, I yield to you. I close my eyes then and picture my mom. Judica rises from the mat and advances. I open my eyes and lift the sword to her, one of my hands under the hilt, one under the blade. Kill me, I say. If that's what it takes for you to forgive mom and me, then do it. I'm so sorry I let you down. I love you. I close my eyes again and wait. But the blow never comes. When I open my eyes, tears stream down Judica's face. She drops the sword and sits down in front of me. No, I yield. No one moves or says a word. I collapse next to Judica and take her hand in mine. She doesn't resist. I only gained Judica's acceptance through offering her what she wanted. Because in that moment, she realized it wasn't what she really needed at all. My gesture won't heal a lifetime of wounds, but it's a step in the right direction. I may have to fight her again and again. She may challenge me every single time we disagree, which I'm sure will happen frequently. But I'm confident that I did the right thing for today. For the first time since mom died, my world is better in this moment than it was the day before. I glance around and the audience is kneeling, every one of them. Edom, Balthazar, Lorena, Noah, they're all kneeling, waiting on me to speak. Every ruler needs a motto, a personal quote. You usually select it at the investiture, but mine comes to me in this moment. I raise my voice so it rings from the rafters. The smallest light still vanquishes darkness. I reach over and grab Mom's ring. When I slide it on my finger, there's absolute silence as the ring fills with power, almost as if my people can sense something is happening. Then the ring flashes brightly enough to flood the room with light. Thankfully, I don't set off any fires or release any EMPs, but a lot of astonished faces stare back at me. For a moment, I stand in utter silence. Then applause fills the room. Thirty-three. Bring us chains, Edom says. Rope won't contain Evians. Most metal won't either. Titanium bindings are expensive and hard to work with, but they're the only thing you can count on. I guess there's a reason most of our sentences end in exile or execution. Imprisonment is impractical in the long run. No, I say. I won't imprison her. She's my heir, and she will be free. Do you believe me? Judica asks. Finally? I do. My voice drops to a faint whisper. Marcel said someone named Nurius bought the poison that was used on Mom. I don't see Balthazar, so I call out his name. Why do you want him? Judica asks. I need to tell him to cancel any plans to bomb China. Judica frowns. What's wrong? I ask. Judica sighs. It's too late. But you promised, I say. You promised not to bomb them. I agreed because I'd already launched the jets. Two nuclear bombs were en route to a tiny town outside of Shanghai before your jet landed. 
I freeze. From where? Alaska, obviously, Judica says. But they're Russian planes, older tech, and no one will be able to trace them to us. I close my eyes and think. When? I gave the order right before your plane landed. It's only been a few hours. I might be able to catch them if I take a fast enough jet. I gave them clear orders, sister. I sent three planes, two to protect the one carrying the nukes. They've turned off all communications and are not to abort for any reason. They'll shoot down anything that comes after them. But she said it herself. They're old Russian tech. If I act fast, I can do something without anyone even knowing what Judica did. You should have killed her, Noah says. She doesn't deserve your forgiveness. Balthazar reaches my side. Who doesn't deserve your forgiveness? Judica, Noah says. She's heir to the throne of Alamecca. Balthazar scowls at Noah and quiets, clearly listening for Noah's heartbeat. Whoa, you brought a pet human? His eyes widen at me. He doesn't understand, I say. He wasn't being disrespectful. And he's not a pet, Noah splutters indignantly. I mean me, I'm not a pet. He shouldn't be here, Balthazar says, ignoring Noah entirely. My mother isn't empress anymore. I stand a little taller. I am, and I'm eliminating the ban she had in place on humans on Ni'ihau. Judica's eyebrows rise. Already shaking things up with the hot human boyfriend. My face heats. It's not like that. But in general, I don't feel like mom did about humans. What does that mean? Balthazar asks. It means I like them. Great, Judica smirks. I've been out of a job for five minutes and the family's already headed for total ruin. I don't have time for this. I need all the information on these bombs immediately, I say. Bring it all to my room. There must be something we can do, some back door to crawl through that will stop this. Balthazar opens his mouth, probably to argue, but then he clicks it shut. Wise man. I walk toward the door, but before I can leave, Judica says, I've done you a favor, whether you want it or not. You wouldn't do it yourself but I've gift-wrapped China for you. This will set the tone for your rule and keep Alameca safe from attack and encroachment by the five. You should thank me. I ignore her. I need to make a call, Noah says. I point at Edom. Go below and free Inara. Take Noah with you and detain him there. He's a friend, and after this is resolved, we'll set him up somewhere safe. But for now, I shake my head. I can't trust him not to do something catastrophically stupid. Edom beams at me. With pleasure. You can't be serious, Noah says. You have to let me help, or at least let me warn my family. Your family isn't anywhere near Shanghai. I have family and friends there, but that's not the point. If his family has pull with the government, they might be able to issue warnings, or maybe even shoot down the planes. Let him call his family as long as he tells them he heard this from a tip that came from a classmate with ties to Russia, I tell Edom. I can't have this blowing back on us if we can't stop it. Once he's warned them, detain him. Judica looks at me as though she's never seen me before. When she smiles at me, a chill slides down my spine. I turn on my heel and walk away from both her and the crowds who seem to think celebrations are in order. I have too much to clean up before I'm ready to breathe a sigh of relief, much less party. Frederick trails me as I leave the room. I walk down the long corridor, head held high, as I pass the people I grew up with. They all bow as I pass, kneeling before me one by one until I reach my room. I throw open the door and stride inside. Devereaux, one of my mom's old guards, catches me at the entrance to my room and hands me a manila envelope. It should contain all the information we have on the planes. Thank you. 
I clutch the envelope in my hand and close the door, leaning against it. My knees wobble and I slide to the floor, sitting in the middle of the carpet to review the information. I look over the paperwork until I have the rudiments of a plan worked out. When I open the door, I expect to see Frederick, not Edom. Oh, hi, I say. Edom doesn't smile, but his eyes sparkle at me, and he cocks one hip. For some reason, a thrill runs through me from my toes to my nose, which is so inappropriate right now. I need our fastest jet. Fuel it up and have it ready to leave immediately, I say. Where are you going, your majesty? Frederick asks from behind Edom. New York, I say. I have some pressing business to take care of there. Alora betrayed me, and if she doesn't have some convincing explanations, she may be taking Inara's vacated cell. Frederick's eyes are sad. Yes, your majesty. Edom's brow furrows. Once Frederick's out of earshot, he asks, should that really be our top priority right now? I jog toward the ballroom by way of answer, and Edom runs right alongside me. Many people have filtered out after the fight, but dozens are still milling around. I raise my voice. I need something witnessed and attested. I must see to some urgent business in person. Edom Nemalesa ex Alameca is named Prince Regent in my absence. You will all do exactly as he says. If he is unable to handle a situation for any reason, Inara Alameca is named Princess Regent, and she will speak for me. The Evians around me cross their arms over their chests, hands fisted and bow. Heard and witnessed, they say when they straighten. I march down from the arena and back out through the doors with Edom. I walk immediately out to the landing strip, and he follows without saying a word. I look up at the plane and say, wait, why are we using Noah's jet? A wiry man I've known my entire life runs the airstrip, Filomino. Your instructions were for the fastest jet, your majesty. It's a passenger aircraft, but it's very fast. He wrings his hands. That's fine, I say, thank you. I step up the stairs to the plane, but Edom grabs my hand. I don't understand. Did I upset you somehow? I'm going to deal with Alora, I say, my voice wobbling convincingly. I really am upset about her betrayal, and I still don't understand it. So he should hear the truth of that in my words. I need you to take care of things until I return. Only Alora can tell me why she betrayed me and to what extent. I need to know, Edom. What about the bomb? He asks. What about it? You heard Judica, and her paperwork confirms it. She didn't build in a cancellation of any kind. There's not much we can do about it now, other than send relief afterward. I wish it wasn't so, but I won't spend any more time dwelling on things I can't change. I've done enough of that for a lifetime. Shouldn't we call the Chinese government and warn them? He asks. Or was one call to Noah's family all you're planning to do? I chafe at the judgment in his tone. Any real warning would create massive panic. And of course, even with back channels, it could destroy any benefit we otherwise stand to gain. Besides, the five would perceive that as weakness at best and as infighting at worst. Judica never should have sent that bomb, but it's done now. If anyone hears I surrendered to Judica, this strike might save my reputation and mitigate the risk to Alameca. Edom holds my gaze for a long time before he finally bows. As you say, your majesty. It stings that he believes me capable of abandoning all those people so quickly, but I need him to buy it. So I walk up the steps and onto the jet without looking back. My fight with Frederick and Arlington takes longer, but I finally succeed in convincing them I'll wait while they assemble a new team. Then I close the door myself and call out to my pilot. Hello? Who's up there? Paul, your majesty. He's my favorite pilot, Philomeno remembered. I wish he hadn't. I expected Noah's people. 
No, your majesty. We sent them to rest. They're not safe to fly right now, so I volunteered, he says. We need to go. Now. Like, this second. We haven't been cleared yet, he says. I'm the Empress, or hadn't you heard? Paul grins. I heard, but what about your guards? I'm instructing you to take off without them. Paul's eyebrows rise. And I have a minor detail to clarify. Yes, your majesty. We're changing our final destination. We aren't going to New York? No, we're headed for Shanghai. Or more specifically, somewhere over the Sea of Okhotsk. I pull out my envelope and flip to the flight information. I take it up to the cockpit and hand it to him. We need to interrupt this flight, and hopefully come down behind them by surprise. Paul confers with his co-pilot, Davi, who I also really like, which makes this much worse. They listen precisely, and I tell them to shut off the radio once we're in the air. Paul looks over the documents on the strike Judica sent once we're in the air. They're flying high, very high, to avoid detection. That's good, right? He shrugs. It is what it is, but we aren't equipped to take them out. We don't have anything but basic defense anti-aircraft artillery. You said fast, not tactical. That doesn't matter. I brought everything we'll need. Paul tilts his head and presses his lips together, but he doesn't argue. Can we catch them? Paul studies the documents and nods. They're ahead of us, but they're using old tech. That means we're much faster than they are. But I need to know more about what you're planning to figure out the best approach. If they see us, they'll take us down immediately. They have pretty clear orders. And this will be sort of like going after a tank and two Humvees with a Porsche. I know. I tap my hand on the seat in front of me. I brought a weapon. Try not to worry about that part over much. I'm going to take all three planes down at the same time. How? Paul eyes me with understandable skepticism. The critical part, I say, the part I'm relying on you to ensure, is that we intercept their flight path in the middle of the ocean without anyone else around. We aren't coming back from this, are we? Paul asks. I glance down at my mom's ring. It sparkles in the light. I doubt very much whether we will. Oh, heck no. Noah pops out of the bathroom at the back of the jet. I knew I was right to come. You sound totally crazy. You're supposed to be in a holding cell. I raise one eyebrow. Noah rolls his eyes. Oh, please, I'm human, not mentally deficient. You took out an Evian guard? I can't quite keep the disbelief out of my voice. He snorts. Let's not get carried away. More like he saw what he expected to see, and I specialize in the unexpected. Was anyone injured? I ask. Noah rolls his eyes. Thanks for the concern for my fragile human person, but I'm fine. My voice is flat. I meant my guards. Relax, they're fine, and I'm only here to help. What exactly are you going to do? I ask. He shakes his head. I obviously don't know yet. I need to see the information you have and hear your full plan. But I'm an excellent problem solver. Paul clears his throat. Well, I'm sure you'll figure out something brilliant with his help. He raises his eyebrows at me. But if you can't come up with anything better, why don't you let me execute your plan for you? I can airdrop you anywhere along here and send a message to home base so they can come and retrieve you. Paul's offering to die in my place. I should airdrop you. I'm ashamed I didn't think of that. Or at least one of you. I doubt I can fly the plane and execute my plan at the same time. It is an honor to serve you, Your Majesty. Paul seems absolutely serious. I cross to where he's standing and put a hand on his shoulder. You've always been kind and brave, too. I appreciate your offer, but I have to do this myself. 
His eyes glanced down at my ring, probably thinking about the weight of ruling, or maybe about the fact that if we all die, the ring is lost again. Who knows, though? Maybe he has guessed that I plan to use the ring somehow. Well, I'll be thinking things over in the cockpit, Paul says. If I have any ideas, I'll let you know. As soon as Paul's gone, I turn to face Noah. I wish you hadn't come. Noah sinks into one of the plush seats. I think about the last time I was in this plane. I was preparing to die then, too. I can't catch a break today. Have you heard of origami? Noah asks. Uh, folding paper cranes? Yeah, I've heard of it. I've been practicing origami since I was four. I've probably made 10,000 paper boxes. So trust me when I say I'm an expert at thinking outside of most any shaped box. Speaking of boxes, there wasn't time, I say, to equip this plane with a Faraday box. So your weapon's an EMP? Noah asks. I nod. How does it work? I glance down at my mom's ring, and Noah follows my gaze. Last time we had trouble, you used your necklace. So what? Your ring turns into an arrow and you shoot it at the other planes? Something like that, I say. I have totally been getting my mom's Christmas gifts at the wrong places. I need the name of your jeweler. Here's the thing, Noah. If anyone else could use this particular weapon, I'd let them. But only I can make it work. And if I weigh my life against that of thousands of humans, I bet a lot of your friends wouldn't come to the same conclusion as you do about the relative value. Noah folds his arms. They wouldn't, no. They'd put a billion human lives up against one Evian, probably. But I'm not them. Your family matters to me as do all the other people living in the area being bombed. I'm so sorry this is happening. I hand him the file. While he looks over it, I think about my doubt before I fought Judica. It didn't help me. In fact, it kept me from seeing the truth for longer. And I need to see the truth of what to do here right away, because if I fail, Judica isn't the bad guy for sending these. I am. For failing to fix it. It's noble of you to be willing to trade your life for people you don't know. Thanks, I say. You know what's even nobler? What? Not dying. Live and save people. That way you can fix all those things that are broken with your family. Thanks, Confucius. Great tip. Noah sits down next to me and rests his hand on mine. Tell me what you're doing, exactly. How does it work? I don't really understand it myself. Well, start at the beginning. To my surprise, I do. Maybe it's because Noah's going to die with me. Maybe it's because he's human. I tell him everything. I tell him about my mom's death and how awful it was. I tell him I don't know who killed her or why. I tell him about Sotiris. I tell him about what happened before she died and how I reacted to the ring. I even tell him about the prophecy, how it ruined my life, and how it's obviously wrong since I'm about to die. So you're sick to death of the guilt? Excuse me? I ask. You tried to get your sister to kill you earlier. Now you're sacrificing yourself to save these people because your mom died for this secret. It must have a purpose, right? If you save these people, then your mom's death wasn't such a waste. And your sister, your poor, hurting, misunderstood sister, can finally have what she always wanted, a sparkly crown all to herself. I frown. You don't get it. Oh, I think I do. Look, I've always thought there must be a God. And if there is, and he gave me this gift that ruined my life, there must be a reason. Maybe it's so I can right this tremendous wrong. Maybe all our decisions lead to others, and there's a purpose behind each of them. If I'd come back sooner, Judica wouldn't have sent this yet. But I didn't. So here I am, fixing my mistake. Dying without cause is cowardly. The Chancery Alameca I've been watching isn't a coward. You suck, Noah. 
I want to save that town full of people too, okay? I'm on board with that. It's the dying horribly part where you lose me. There must be some way for you to use that ring without knocking out our plane at the same time. I think about it. Isn't that what my mom wanted? For me to master the ring and be able to direct the projection of the EMP? The problem is that I focus my energy and it just bursts out of the ring. I'm not sure how far, but it wiped out our entire island and part of a neighboring one the first time. That's a pretty hot blast, Noah says. Yeah. There was a second time? My mom made me practice a little. How'd that go? Not so great, I say. Near the end, I directed the pulse so that it took out everything in front of me first, before the electronics beside me shorted. Noah thinks for a moment. Maybe the problem is the goal. We're imagining that we'll fly up behind the planes, right? Zoom down behind them and zap all three, right? I nod. Basically. And if we do that, when our electronics are fried, we all lose altitude at the same time, and the bomb will be triggered below a certain altitude, and boom, we all die, right? Yep. So instead, how about we fly at them head on and pass them? Then you stand at the back of the jet and take them out. We'll be headed in opposite directions. So if you send your pulse out in just one direction, best case, we don't fry our plane. And worst case, we're already heading away from the other planes when we do. The warhead detonates at altitude, but they're flying west and we're flying east, I finish for him. We might get far enough away to survive the blast. Noah smiles. I've heard you heal pretty well. I mean, as a human, I'll still be toast, but you might pull through. I punch his shoulder. It might work. It's better than my suicide plan, except for two things. If we pass them, they'll see us and they'll shoot and kill us. Let's talk to Paul. But if we pass them way below or way above, then drop precipitously, maybe it could work. Maybe they won't see us. Even if we work that out, if we pass them first before I use the pulse, I'll only get one shot. What if I mess up? Don't. Very helpful. You have to think about directing the pulse. I saw you use your little necklace bombs before. He points at my chain. You're really good with it. Think of the EMP as a slingshot. If you focus on throwing the pulse away from us. He shrugs. I talk to Paul about the logistics, and we work out the kinks in Noah's plan. Paul thinks we can sneak past them. It helps that we have all the details on the planes, and they're dated. Plus, Noah's plane is a commercial one, not a fighter jet, so they might not automatically suspect us. Once I work all that out, it's time for the part Noah is going to hate. Now that we might survive this, Noah says, I think we need to get a message to our boy Edom so he knows where to come looking for us. I didn't want him to try and stop me, I say. But now that we might make it home, yeah, you're right. I grab Noah, and before he has time to react, I wrap both his arms behind him. Paul helps me bind him up, and we prepare for an emergency airdrop. Noah shouts and hollers and squawks. We ignore him. Once we have Noah bound and ready to drop, with a parachute he can release and a raft with a homing beacon, I dial up the in-flight phone and call the palace. I need to speak with the Prince Regent. Did you just say Prince Regent? Noah groans. That's a ridiculous name, and I can't just let that pass. But also, that old man is going to be even more insufferable after this. Shut up. I kick at Noah but he hops out of the way. A voice in the receiver distracts me. Hello? Edom? Why did you leave without guards? He asks. And why did you shut the radio off? I've been debating whether to send a strike force after you. Do not send a strike force. I'm fine. I had Paul shut off the radio, and I left before the guards could board on purpose. Edom sighs. I expected something like this. You're headed for China. 
I'm somewhere over the Pacific right now. Yes. Edom curses. A lot. I couldn't let them die, I say. There's nothing you can do. I thought you understood that. There is something, I say. My mom's ring is a weapon. It caused that EMP the day before she died. I caused that EMP with it. He swears even more creatively. If I'd known, I'd have tied you down in your room until that bomb went off. And that's why I didn't tell you. I'm keeping you from committing treason. You're welcome. You'd be surprised what I'll do to keep you alive, Chansey. Well, then I'm glad you didn't know, because I need your help. I have a stowaway, and I'm about to airdrop him and send you the coordinates. Please send someone to fetch him quickly. And in about half an hour, it's quite likely my plane will go down too. We'll turn on tracking so you can, hopefully, find us as well. I'll come myself. The Prince Regent absolutely cannot leave the island, I say firmly. Then why did you name Inara as my backup? I grumble under my breath, but I knew he'd do this before I called. Accept the world as it is. I hate that stupid motto. Have I ever told you that? No, I smile. I'm not surprised, though. I've hated it for years. It should be, accept the world as it is, or order troops to change it while you're safe at home because you can't do every single little thing yourself. That's not very snappy, Noah says. Wait, Noah's with you? I dropped him off downstairs myself. We definitely need to look into that upon our return, I say. If I return. I have no idea how he escaped and snuck on. How did you manage to leave without Frederick? Edom asks. Uh, I say. I sent Freddy to run an errand. He wouldn't tell me how you slipped away, but he's not happy about it. I'm low on time. I give Edom the coordinates and signal Paul to open the escape hatch. It creates a lot less wind than I expected which is good because I have to cut the ties on Noah's hands. Then I shove him out the door before he can argue with me anymore. No matter how great his plan, no human could survive a plane crash coupled with a nuclear bomb. He needs to get out now, while he has a chance to survive this. Wow, who knew it was this fun to shove someone out an escape hatch? I ask. Paul is busy with buttons and knobs, but he tosses a grin back at me. I'll look into that. If we survive. I head for the back so I don't distract him, but with Noah gone, it's eerily quiet. Paul and David prepare for the final course corrections, and I review my plan in my head. The minutes drag without Noah's jokes. I hope he's okay in the middle of the ocean. I hope Edom doesn't have any trouble finding him. I hope my plan stands a chance of working. I review the plan for the rendezvous over and over in my head. But finally, it's time. Paul clears his throat. Your Majesty? Yes? They're getting close, up ahead. I walk to the cockpit and squint. I can barely make out three aircraft, two smaller ones flanking a larger plane below. I walk to the back of the jet and buckle into the chair at the very back. I wish it swiveled around. Open the emergency doors, I shout. He does. The wind whips my hair around my face and tugs on my clothes, but I remain focused, which is why I see the jets peel off. We've done everything we planned, Paul yells, but I think they saw us. They're not going to let us fly past. I undo my buckle and run toward the cockpit staggering and grabbing chairs and railings to claw my way forward. One of the MiGs fires something at us. David presses a button. Flares. The missile zooms down below us. This might be a good time for you to do whatever you're doing, Paul says. Duh. The other MiG shoots off a missile as they close on us. It's now or never. So much for my EMP pulse from the back of the plane. I focus on the lights flashing in Mom's ring and think of my anger, my hatred for Nereus, whoever he or she is, and what it's done to my family. 
I imagine my little sister. The little sister I'll never hug or kiss or sing to sleep. I take all that anger, that hatred, that fury, and I imagine I'm putting it all in a slingshot and shooting it at the planes and the missile. And bam, it tears out of me. The second missile explodes in front of us and we fly through the debris, Noah's jet lurching and shuddering. But the planes don't alter their course. Did it work? I ask. I watch as the jet and MiGs fly past us, seemingly unharmed. Oh, crap! I got the missile and missed the real target. I race to the back of the jet, flipping head over heels and flying past a dozen seats in the wind whipping through the jet before I grab one of the side railings. My heart throws somersaults in my chest. The jets are specks on the horizon. But when I poke my head around the corner of the emergency door, I can see them. Barely. And the cup in my head is finally full again. This time, I don't try to aim or direct anything. I fling the power out of me and at the three aircraft, with the full force of my rage, loss, despair, fear, and hope. A fireball flies through the air, and a strange sort of vibration blows past it and outward. I squint up ahead to see the wave hit the three aircraft. I breathe a big sigh of relief when they all begin losing altitude at an alarming rate. I scream for Paul's help closing the emergency doors. When we return to the cockpit of our plane, I'm relieved to see lights and dials still whirring and beeping and flashing. You did it, Paul says. You sent the EMP to them. Our controls still work. Now we just need to survive the fusion bomb. Five hundred times stronger than the original bombs mom detonated before. Ugh. One thing at a time. David pulls on a lever and the jet accelerates. Let's put some distance between them and us. Please go sit down and buckle up, Paul says. Any minute, the blast will hit us. You need to brace yourself. There's a sound like my ears popping, and then a bump like no turbulence I've ever felt. And then the world goes black. Thirty-four. Buzzing fills my ears, and my head is stuffed with cotton. I shake my head and yawn, and I open my eyes. Edom and Noah are arguing directly in front of me. I focus on the movement of their mouths and realize there is an echoey reverberation that matches their voices faintly, behind the buzzing. Of course, you idiot. It's not like I didn't think of that. Edom's fist is clenched, and he towers over Noah menacingly. Then why are you standing there stupidly? Noah asks. Get a syringe. Her body might need a boost. You're pushy for someone whose blood would not only be useless, Edom says. It would probably also give her hepatitis. Noah's shoulders straighten. I've had just about enough. I focus on my ear canals and drums and the buzzing dissipates, leaving only an underlying humming. It could be the sound of rotors. Hello? My voice is raspy. It doesn't sound like me. A split second later, both their faces swim over mine. I blink and blink and blink until they both come into focus. Where are we? On an albatross, which is a friggin' seaplane. Noah rolls his eyes and jerks his thumb at Edom. This one's idea of a rescue. I am so happy to see your gorgeous blue eyes, Edom says. They're blue again? I blink more. Your retinas must have burned off in the blast, and they always regrow their original color. Edom shudders. There's a phrase I wish I didn't need to say. I like them better this way, Noah says. They almost match mine. How do you have blue eyes anyway? I ask Noah. Can we focus on relevant facts? Edom asks. You're the one who brought up the eye color, Noah says. Edom glares at him, 
but doesn't yell or throw any projectiles. I think it's progress. I roll my newly blue eyes at them. I'm relieved to see you both. I worried Edom might leave Noah floating in the ocean forever. The thought did cross my mind, Edom says. Some shark would be desperate enough to eat him eventually. I'm glad he survived, I say, because I think I'm going to need Noah to call his parents and tell them the tip was bad. We don't want to cause some kind of incident now that it's been diffused. Sure, Noah says. Or we can give him a replacement jet and send him home, Edom says. He can tell them himself. Not a terrible idea, I say. He does need to get back. He can't stay here amidst all this madness. I think returning me should be low on the priority list. You broke your neck in the crash, Noah says. And most of your skin and face were- He cuts off and shakes his head like he wants to erase the memory. They were burned off, he gulps. That sounds really gross. I move my neck back and forth and touch my face. But I feel fine now. It was kind of cool to watch you healing, but it was slow. A lot slower than during your fight with your sister, Noah says. A terrible thought occurs to me. If I broke my neck, what about Paul and David? Did the others? I can't bring myself to ask. Edom shakes his head. David and Paul were both Sela's boys. Evian families grow quite large, with such long lifespans and so many displaced heirs. Sela's my first cousin, daughter of my aunt, and her boys served the family long and well. I wish I could blame Judica, but this solution was my decision. I'll call her when we reach home, I say. Sela deserves to hear it from me. A true ruler understands the responsibility that comes with freedom, Edom says. Your mom would be proud. I wondered how Edom would react if I survived the fight with Judica. I hoped he'd be pleased, but I haven't had time to interact with him at all, really. And I lied to him right after appointing him my prince regent. He could be angry, very angry. Noah, I ask, can you give us a minute? Noah doesn't joke or poke or anything else. He nods and walks to the far end of the plane. When he's far enough away that he can't see us very well, I look at Edom. He meets my gaze for a long moment before he says, I was so afraid. Worse than when you fought Judica because I couldn't even see whether you were okay. I had to do something, I say. It's who you are. But don't ever do anything like that again without telling me, please. I'm Empress of Alameca. I'm surprised my tongue doesn't stumble over the words. I'm surprised I don't choke on them. But somehow they sound right. I'm Empress. No big deal. I just rule a sixth of the world. Danger's part of the deal, Edom, and it always will be. He shakes his head. You'll never run from a fight, and that's one of the things I love about you. People see your mercy as weakness, but they're wrong. Being a good person doesn't make you a weak person. Then you understand. Edom closes the space between us and takes my hand. I understand you, but I need you to understand me. You can't leave me back at home to stand watch over your throne and polish your crown. You can't do that because I don't care about the throne, and I care a great deal about you. So the next time you leave to pursue some harebrained scheme, promise you'll take me with you. I can't breathe. I've been supportive, Chancery. I'll always stand with you. The next words sound strangled. No matter who you eventually choose for your consort, I'll always defend and protect you. I think you will be the best ruler Alameca has ever had, but that's not the only reason I'll stand by you. His voice drops almost an octave, and it does something to my stomach. Something shivery, something not quite comfortable. I love you, Chancery. I love your mercy and I love your strength. 
I love your humor and I love your intensity. I love your reticence and I love your boldness. Those things aren't opposites, they're complementary. You're complex and caring and unique, and a world without you in it feels unbearably bleak to me. Let me place you first and we'll be fine. Can you do that? I think so, I whisper. And you should know that I didn't only offer to be your consort to keep you safe. I did it because nothing would bring me more joy. I open my mouth, but Edom places a finger over it. You are not ready to make that kind of decision, and I respect that. You're so young still, and I'll never rush you. But I want you to be utterly positive about where I stand. Say the word tomorrow, or next week, or in a year, or in a hundred years. I won't change my mind. As I look into his eyes, so full of longing, I want to say yes. It would be so much simpler to have someone to rely on, someone to share this load with. I trust him, and I believe what he told me. But a part of me isn't ready to choose a consort. Besides, I need to be strong now, and immediately choosing a consort doesn't seem like the action of a person who can manage things alone. I may be young, but I'm not a little girl who needs saving. I can't, I say. Not yet. So I'm saying no, but I'm not saying never. Edom brushes his lips against mine. I'll take it. He straightens and takes a seat, and I think our conversation is over. I barely hear his next question. Is it because of my sister? I don't think so. I shake my head. But I don't know. He looks away again, and this time I don't say anything else because there's nothing more to say. When we get back home, the palace in Ni'ihau looks like a kicked anthill. Balthazar's waiting at the bottom of the stairs. He pulls me down and into strong, familiar arms. Welcome back, and congratulations, Chancery. You deserve it. You could have won the traditional way, but what you did was even harder. Knowing their opponent is something very few people manage to do. Your mother would be so proud of you. You've grown into the woman she always wanted you to become. I wipe away a tear and squeeze him a little tighter. I never knew my dad, but I've always imagined he'd be a little bit like Balthazar. Tough, handsome, knowledgeable, and gruff but always speaking the truth. Thanks. He releases me, but still looks at me warmly. Now, we need to talk about setting up your personal guard. Tomorrow, I say, will be soon enough. Who will keep you safe tonight? He asks. Noah and Edom both take a step closer. I try not to roll my eyes. I'm keeping Frederick as head of my personal guard. Balthazar raises his eyebrows. Do you trust him? I nod. Yes. He sighs. Okay, but what about these two? He doesn't even pretend to whisper. One of them is a human, and the other is Judica's ex-boyfriend. Hardly a suitable support team. I don't roll my eyes, and I won't roll my eyes, because it's not respectful. I'm okay with it. I'll inform Frederick of his position and ask him to coordinate our process for establishing your guard and the rotation. Lorena, Mom's Chamberlain, finds me next. Your Majesty, welcome back. Agents of the Five have all contacted us to extend congratulations, and they're all asking when the investiture will take place. Monday. We've waited long enough. She nods. Alora has requested permission to visit and extend her congratulations. I ought to order her to come. I should drag her here in chains. Granted, I should set up a trial, but I can't bring myself to do it, not with Alora, at least not until I know exactly what she did and why. Shades of gray, why are there so many? Of course, that's not everything. Lorena, whom I plan to keep as my chamberlain, 
has a million other questions, but I'm too tired to answer them all. I've nearly reached my room when Inara stomps into view. Seeing her hale and whole in front of me warms every chamber of my heart. I run toward her and she pulls me into a tight hug. I watched the video feed, she says, a tear in her left eye. And you were absolutely brilliant. Thank you, I say. Do you think I made a mistake? Sparing her life, Inara asks. I swallow. Probably, but you're not Inora, and you're not me, and you're not Judica. You have to do what you think is right. I smile at her. Thanks. Did you find the sword I left you? I bob my head. I am sorry for what you went through here alone, so sorry. And it was so generous of you to offer me that sword, but I couldn't risk your future if I lost. Inara's smile is sad. And you found Mother's old sword, and you did a beautiful thing with it. I'm so proud of you, little dove. Proud enough to step in for me? I ask. Because Lorena has a lot of questions, and I'm about to collapse from exhaustion. Of course. Inara bites her lip. But before you go to sleep, I have news. Nothing good judging by her expression. Noah and Edom both inch a little closer to me as if they can protect me from it. Um, you do know this one's human. Inara eyes Noah like she'd eye a McDonald's hamburger or Payless shoes. I do, it's fine. I'm not at all saying this as an I told you so. I think what you did was brave and merciful, and that's sort of your brand but sometimes mercy isn't warranted. Just tell me what happened. It's Judica, she says. What about her, I ask. Did she set her room on fire, or she's on a hunger strike? What? She's gone. Thank you for listening. This has been Displaced, the Birthright series, book one. Written by Bridget E. Baker. Narrated by Jennifer Jill Araya. Copyright 2019 by Bridget E. Baker. Production copyright 2020 by Bridget E. Baker.